Okay, uh, good evening all, uh, my teachers, seniors, colleagues, and dear postgraduates. Myself, Dr. Ani Praveen. On behalf of IAPM Kerala, in association with Mindry India, it is my pleasure to welcome you all for the fourth consecutive online webinar session, Head and Neck Pathology. So we are pleased to host uh, prominent pathologists from across the country and the world for this two-day webinar. This will serve as introduction to the next 90th chapter meeting scheduled on Sunday, 12th February, 2023, where head and neck pathology, excluding thyroid, is the slide seminar topic. It is my honor and privilege to welcome our distinguished speakers, Dr. Joaquin Garcia, surgical and molecular pathologist at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota, USA. Dr. Shubhata Kane, former professor and HOD Department of Pathology, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Anjal Kakar, Associate Professor, Department of Pathology, Ames, Delhi. Dr. Munita Bal, Professor, Department of Pathology, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. And Dr. Paramita Roy, Senior Consultant, Department of Pathology, Tata Memorial, Tata Medical Center, Kolkata, who will be with us for the next two days to share the vast knowledge and experience. At this time, I also want I also want to extend my warm welcome to the distinguished moderator, moderators who have graciously consented to preside over each session. Dr. Shankar S., Principal former, and former Professor in HOD of Department of uh, Government Medical College, Kottayam. Uh, Dr. Anila K. R., Associate Professor, Regional Cancer Center, Tiruvannandapuram. Dr. Smitha N. V., Associate Professor, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. Dr. Lada Abraham, Senior Consultant, Rajagiri Hospital, Alwa. And Dr. Shalini Kurivila, uh, Senior Consultant, Astermims, Calicut. I welcome and thank MindTrade team for providing us this platform to conduct this academic section. And lastly, but not the least, this chapter would like to invite all its members and consultant pathologists and postgraduate graduates across the country to be part of this webinar. Now I welcome Dr. Rajanji, sir, President, IAPM Kerala for the presidential address. Over to you, sir. So yes, I will take only one minute, respected speakers. Respected chairpersons, uh, respected senior faculty members, as well as the postgraduates. As the secretary said, it's the fourth consecutive uh, online webinar we are conducting just before our chapter meetings. And this time our chapter meeting is on February 12th, where the slide seminar topic is on head and neck pathology, excluding thyroid. So Dr. Anila is actually moderating. Uh, she's from Regional Cancer Center. She is moderating the session. So this is actually just a curtain raiser for the academic pathology slide center. Uh, I, again, you see that uh, I am totally indebted to Dr. Anila because she has actually, uh, she fixed the program, she classified the topics and she has, uh, along with the Ajit Nambiar, we find out the best faculty nationwide as well as international. And fortunately, we get the best out in, in India. Uh, like the previous times, right? So, uh, again, I am thankful to Mindre team because it's a fourth time they are supporting us just like anything. So, when Mindre is there, we have a lot of confidence in doing this, all this online webinar without any problem. So, thank you, Nikhil and Mindre team, Shema and all that. And again, thank you all the delegates for uh, coming here. And uh, so, uh, there is a change in the program schedule. Uh, it's actually starting with, according to the original program schedule, it start with uh, Dr. Garcia, that is 6.30 to 7.30, but he's unable to join today online live. So his talk is postponed to tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. So today we have only two uh, speakers. One is uh, Dr. Anchal, he's starting the talk with, at, uh, just now. And after that, it is uh, uh, Dr. Kane Madam from TMH Mumbai. She is uh, uh, starting her talk at 7.30 p.m. And today it's only two talk and tomorrow it is three talk. The tomorrow, the first talk start at 6.30 p.m. And Dr. Garshi is actually uh, the speaker. The second and third talk is actually by Dr. Munita as well as Dr. Paramita. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the inconvenience because uh, it is last time uh, we could announce the program uh, rescheduling, but again, you see that the, all the five speakers are there. So only thing is that 
today there is only two talk okay thank you very much thank you very much so any so without further ado uh, we will we will start with the first session of the day to introduce the speaker i welcome dr smitha n smitha n b associate professor amrita institute of medical science madam's areas of interest include head and neck as well as breast over to you ma'am yes good evening everyone it's my pleasure to introduce uh, dr anchal kakkar uh, speaker for the first of our webinar series uh, she is currently the associate professor at department of pathology all india institute of medical sciences delhi and she took up the head and neck uh, sub specialty in 2017 and has been conducting uh, remarkable uh, research in this area she had uh, she was instrumental in starting techniques like mrna ish for hpv in head and neck cancers and fish for gene rearrangements in salivary gland neoplasms in the department and she is uh, well versed in other molecular techniques she has over uh, 150 publications and over 15 book chapters to her credit including she is uh, uh, contributed to several chapters in the fifth recent fifth edition of who book, book series head and neck endocrine and who hematolymphoid uh, neoplasms Uh, she is a recipient of several awards including the prestigious dr n c naik award for the talented young pathologist by delhi chapter um uh, today's topic uh, is uh, the hpv related uh, tumors in head and neck cancer uh, over the recent years uh, this is a very hot topic in the head and neck area especially because uh, of the Uh, in introduction of this hpv into the staging system of one of the prominent cancers of head and neck region and we have uh, also certain other rare tumors which are associated with hpv also so there is lot of interest in in this area regarding the various aspects of this uh, this topic so uh, i warmly welcome dr anshal to get into the topic and enlighten us over to you dr anshu good evening everyone thank you dr smita for that introduction and i would like to thank the office bearers of the kerala chapter iapm for including me in this webinar prior to the 90th chapter meeting thank you so much okay so i'm going to be speaking about hpv associated head and neck cancers and and we know that hpv has been increasingly recognized as a key etiological driver in carcinomas of the head and neck region with hpv associated oropharyngeal carcinoma being the prototypic manifestation of head and neck hpv related neoplasia which led to a paradigm shift in the classification and staging of head and neck cancers the who 2017 saw the classification of oropharyngeal tumors being separated from that of the oral cavity and the hsac staging system eighth edition which came out in 2017 also staged oropharyngeal cancers separately from oral cancers and divided them into hpv mediated and hpv unrelated carcinomas uh, the hpv related oropharyngeal cancer epidemic was recognized when in the late 1980s it was noted that there was a sharp decline in the incidence of head and neck cancer due to a gradual decrease in primary risk factors like smoking and alcohol however while this was relevant for sites like the oral cavity and larynx there was a dramatic increase in oropharyngeal cancers and this was found to be due to an increase in an exponential increase in the incidence of hpv positive cancers while there was a decrease in the incidence of hpv negative cancers what is human papilloma virus it belongs to a family of uh, not small non enveloped icosahedral viruses with double stranded circular dna 
These viruses infect basal keratinocytes of mucosal and cutaneous epithelia of humans and animals. They are classified into 53 genera based on the sequences of the capsid protein L1. Five genera include viruses which infect humans, and these are known as the human papilloma viruses. There are about 200 different genotypes of HPV, and these are characterized into mucosal and cutaneous HPV. Mucosal HPVs are further categorized into high risk and low risk, low risk types according to their potential to induce malignancy in the cervix where they were first recognized to have neoplastic potential. 12 high risk HPV types are classified by, as oncogenic with HPV 16 being the most significant in all cancers including cervical and head and neck cancers followed by HPV 18 and then several other types. Uh, HPV-16 accounts for about 80% of oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas followed by HPV-18. These small viruses contain a circular double-stranded DNA genome of about 8 kilobase pair, which is organized into three major regions, the upstream regulatory region, which is the origin of replication and includes transcription factor binding sites and controls gene expression. Then you have the early region, which encodes for genes involved in multiple functions, including viral replication and host cell transformation, followed by the late region, which encodes for the L1 and L2 capsid proteins, which are required for self-assembly to form new virions. Coming to the entry and life cycle of HPV, the major capsid protein L1 binds to the heparin sulfate chains of proteoglycans, which are located on the cell membrane or in the extracellular matrix. This leads to a conformational change in the capsid structure, exposing the minor capsid protein L2, which then gets cleaved to expose L2 amino acids, which then interact with a secondary receptor on the cell and allow internalization of the virus. Once inside the cell, the, the virus enters the endosome where the low pH causes disassembling of the L1 from the L2 capsid protein, and the L2 viral DNA complex moves into the Golgi network. Where, from where it then moves to the cell nucleus. However, for this, the cell has to progress to early mitosis. Inside the nucleus, the L2-mediated viral genome delivery goes to the uh, ND10 nuclear domain where transcript, viral transcription and replication takes place. In the initial phase of infection, the SP100 nuclear antigen, which is a component of the ND10, represses transcri transcription and replication of HPV DNA. However, as infection persists, L2 uh, capsid protein leads to alteration of the composition of ND10 protein, leading to, re uh, leading to release or degradation of SP100 and further transcription and replication of HPV DNA. So once internalized, the, life the replication cycle of HPV is linked to the differentiation of the infected epithelium. Initially, there's only establishment replication with only about 50 to 100 copies of viral DNA per cell which is followed by the maintenance phase where there's a rapid increase in the number of viral copies and which remain constant. This is followed by productive viral replication and viral assembly and progeny production. Why do we have HPV-induced carcinogenesis only in the oropharynx and not at other sites like the oral cavity? This is because the tonsillar crypts have a specialized reticulated epithelium with breaks in the basement membrane and close interaction with the lymphoid cell which en enables the HPV infection to lurk within this, these crypts and interact between the lymphocytes and the epithelium. Once the virus enters the epithelial cells through gaps in the basement membrane, it causes a persistent infection in the basal layer, which leads to increased production of the early gene expression uh, E6 of E6 and E7 uh, genes, which induces proliferation of the basal cells. Following this, uh, the uh, E1, E2, E4, and E5 are expressed in the infected cells, which again leads to further proliferation of the basaloid cells, which is why these tumors have a basaloid appearing morphology. Once the cells proliferate and move upward into the epithelium, the viral genome is carried upwards. Subsequently, the L1, L2 are synthesized, leading to viral genome amplification and virion formation and release. Persistent expression of E6, E7 or over a prolonged pre period then cause an integration of the viral genome into host DNA. We know that E6 and E7 are the transforming oncoproteins of HPV. E6 e, uh, protein, uh, is a small protein of about 150 amino acids, 
which binds to the cellular li ubiquitin ligase E6 AP protein to form a trimeric complex with P53, leading to the proteasomal degradation of P53 and inhibition of P21. It also activates TERT, leading to cell proliferation and immortalization. P53 degradation results in de deregulation of DNA damage repair and cellular cell senescence, resulting in cell cycle progression. E7 is another small protein which targets the RB family of proteins and results in release and activation of E to F transcription factors that drive the expression of S phase gene. It also induces deregulation of the cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors P21 and P27, leading to direct activation of CDK2 and resulting in S phase entry and cell cycle pro uh, progression. Degradation of RB proteins also leads to P16 overexpression as normally RB is uh, responsible for suppression of P16 in a overexpression. So in this manner, the E6 and E7 proteins cause cell cycle activation progression to the S phase and where DNA replication occurs. There's loss of tumor suppressor function, inhibition of apoptosis, increased telomerase activity, all of which lead to cell cycle uh, progression and cellular proliferation. So that is how HPV causes head and neck cancers. But what all cancers does it cause? We know we are all very familiar with oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, but we also have to remember that there are other cancers that are caused by HPV, including a subset of metastatic squamous cell carcinoma of unknown primary site, which uh, with only metastasis in the lymph nodes. Next, we have sinonasal HPV-associated squamous cell carcinoma. Another tumor in the sinonasal region, which is HPV-related multi-phenotypic sinonasal carcinoma. And recently, oral dysplasia has also been found to harbor transcriptionally active uh, HPV. In a head and neck pathology practice and as general, general surgical pathologists, one might come across ocular and neck cell carcinomas as well, which show HPV association. HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer, as I mentioned, is the prototypical HPV-related head and neck cancer. It is a histopathologically and clinically unique subset of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, as it has unique demographic profiles, different clinical presentation, distinct morphological features and genetics, and improved clinical outcomes as compared to head and neck cancer squamous cell carcinoma at other sites. 80 to 90% of oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas are HPV positive. However, this is from Western literature. High risk HPV accounts for around 90 to 95% in some studies, whereas in cervical cancer, only around 50% is accounted for by HPV 16. A small subset occurred due to HPV 18 and other high risk HPV types. The unique morphology uh, and the clinical behavior of oropharyngeal. Uh, HPV-associated squamous cell carcinoma is attributed to the histology of the oropharynx. As I mentioned, the presence of the tonsillar tissue with crypts lined by the reticulated epithelium, which you can see here, does not have an intact basement membrane and the lymphocytes are intermingled with the epithelial cells. As compared to the oral mucosa, where you can see there's an intact basement membrane and the cells are very tightly cohesive and lymphocytes are not present within the, within the epithelium. This lymphocyte trafficking and the presence of the reticulated basement membrane provides a permissive environment for HPV infection and promotes HPV-driven tumorigenesis. It is also uh, postulated that it provides unobstructed access to lymphatics and be may be responsible for the early metastasis that occur in these patients, even though they have small tumors. Clinically, it differs from that of smoking-related head and neck squamous cell carcinoma at sites like oral cavity and larynx. Patients are about a decade younger, are of high socioeconomic status, and there's a strong male preponderance. They typically lack a significant history of tobacco or alcohol abuse. Some of them may be previous smokers. Sexual behavior has been found to have an important role in the pathogenesis as it plays a role in HPV transmission, increased number of lifetime sexual partners, practicing oral sex, infrequent use of barriers during vaginal or oral sex, and ever having had a sexually transmitted disease increases the risk of HPV transmission and developing HPV-associated oropharyngeal carcinoma. These tumors have an advanced clinical stage at presentation. They have low T stage, that is, they have small-sized tumors, and high end stage, that is, 
even though they have small primary tumors, they have large and multiple lymph node metastasis. Nodal metastasis are present in about 80 to 85% of HPV positive oropharyngeal cancer, and these are frequently cystic. Most importantly, oropharyngeal carcinoma related to HPV has a much better outcome as compared, compared to HPV unrelated squamous cell carcinoma. Meta-analysis data has shown that these tumors are, have a better disease specific and overall survival, a risk of death which is lower by 38 to 80% as compared to HPV negative tumors. Smokers with HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma have an intermediate or worse prognosis. It is not as good as the prognosis of patients who do not smoke and have HPV positive cancer. The improved survival in these HPV positive oropharyngeal cancer patients is attributed to younger age diagnosis, superior performance status, absence of field cancerization that occurs due to in tobacco induced carcinogenesis, radiation responsiveness as the de degradation of P53 is by E6 and not due to mutations with an intact apoptotic response to radiation and chemotherapy. And these tumors harbor fewer genetic abnormalities as compared to HPV negative squamous cell carcinomas. On histomorphology as well, these tumors have a characteristic non-keratinizing morphology. They, they are tumors that infiltrate beneath the surface epithelium, which may be intact, and does not show the presence of keratinizing dysplasia. The tumors form nests or lobules with smooth edges, often with central comedo-like necrosis. The tumors have pushing borders and they lack desmoplastic stroma. Tumor cells have high nucleocytoplasmic ratio. They have oval to spindle hyperchromatic nuclei, syncytial cytoplasm, and usually lack cytoplasmic keratinization. In situ lesions are not recognized in oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, which is HPV positive, and all HPV positive uh, squamous uh, lesions are considered invasive with potential for metastasis. And lastly, grading is not applicable. Prior to being identified as a distinct entity, most of these were graded as poorly differentiated as they lack keratinization. However, they should be considered as they're actually a well-differentiated type of cancer because they closely resemble the reticulated epithelium of the crypts of the tonsils and the base of tongue. These tumors typically arise within the crypts. You can see here that this is the crypt and the tumor is arising from it. And they mimic, often mimic an in-situ lesion without definitive invasion being evident, as also seen in this image. However, P16 immunohistochemistry can help identify the presence of cancer, as you can see the abrupt transition between the normal and the abnormal mucosa. On a low magnification, they are blue looking, and that is because these squamous cells do not show maturation. This is because HPV, E6, and E7 cause an uncoupling of cell proliferation and differentiation. So while the cells continue to proliferate, they do not differentiate into mature keratinocytes. Brisk mitotic activity is present in these tumors. Apoptosis is also frequent. So a small percentage of HPV positive squamous cell carcinomas do show keratinization. They might show minimal keratinization when it's called keratinization with maturation. And these typically show a retraction artifact around the islands. And the maturation is seen at the periphery rather than at the center of tumor islands, unlike in oral or laryngeal cancer, where the keratinization is typically within the center of the nest of cells. Very occasionally, they may have completely keratinizing morphology. This is the keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, which was P16 positive. Some of the other morphological subtypes of squamous cell carcinoma that may be HPV associated include basaloid squamous cell carcinoma, where you see small blue looking cells with abundant basement membrane in between the tumor cells, giving a trabecular appearance, and these show peripheral palisading. Papillary squamous cell carcinoma, where it is very difficult to identify invasion into the deeper tissue. Lymphoepithelial carcinoma, adenosquamous carcinoma, ciliated adenosquamous carcinoma, and small cell carcinoma. What we have to remember is that while all of these subtypes till here, they have an improved prognosis because of HPV association, HPV associated small cell carcinoma does not share the improved prognosis of HPV-related carcinomas. 
Lymph node metastasis from HPV-associated squamous cell carcinomas are frequently cystic, and they mimic benign lesions like thyroglossal duct cyst, branchial cleft cyst, or lymphoepithelial cyst. As you can see, that the center, the tumor cells are predominantly necrotic, and there is only a very thin rim of tumor cells lining the cyst wall. However, these cells show irregular stratification, loss of polarity, nuclear hyperchromasia, and they can be highlighted by P16 immunostaining. Coming to HPV testing, when should we test a tumor for HPV? The CAP recommendation was published in 2018 and later endorsed by ASCO. And they said that all newly diagnosed oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma should undergo HPV testing regardless of the histological type, either on the primary or on the metastasis. On tissue specimens, the surrogate marker for high-risk HPV is P16 immunohistochemistry, which is recommended by almost everyone. Additional HPV-specific testing may be performed at the discretion of the pathologist or the clin treating clinician or in the context of a clinical trial. HPV testing should also be performed in all squamous cell carcinomas with an unknown primary which metastasized to the upper or mid cervical lymph nodes, that is level 2 or level 3. The, the, the upcoming WHO classification has essential and desirable diagnostic criteria. So the essential criteria is that it is usually non-keratinizing. However, it doesn't state that it has to be non-keratinizing. And this, uh, it should be positive for surrogate marker P16 immunohistochemistry with the cutoff being 70% nuclear and cytoplasmic staining or by P16 immunohistochemistry plus HPV specific testing. However, WHO doesn't specify when you need to perform HPV specific testing. Coming to reporting templates, the CAP protocol uh, for head and neck biomarker reporting states that P16 immunohistochemistry is a good surrogate marker for transcriptionally active high-risk HPV, and the other tests that can be performed are listed. In the ICCR data set for oropharyngeal carcinoma, P16 immunohistochemistry is a core data element, whereas high-risk HPV testing by molecular methods is a non-core data element, which means that we compulsorily have to mention the P16 uh, immunohistochemistry results, whereas the others are not compulsorily included. Coming to the clinical aspect, the NCCN guidelines for head and neck cancer states that there are no diagnostic tests with regulatory approval, but recommends P16 immunohistochemistry in all patients diagnosed with oropharyngeal cancer. But they state that due to variations in sensitivity and specificity of testing options, multiple methods may be used in combination for HPV detection. So I mentioned transcriptionally active HPV. What does this mean? So we know that the viral particles first undergo transcription for, uh, where the genome is replicated, followed by translation. So the presence of the, the viral DNA genome itself within a tumor cell does not indicate that it is oncogenically active. It just indicates that the DNA of the virus is present within a cell. However, the E6, E7 mRNA, when expressed by the active virus, indicates the oncogenic activity as this can only occur after it has integrated with the host genome. And the E6, E7 oncoproteins then induce carcinogenesis. So the detection of E6, E7 mRNA in, uh, detects what may be the driver, uh, um, driver virus, whereas detection of DNA also detects passenger virus, which may be present in the cytoplasm of the cell and has not yet integrated with the host genome. So coming to the methods available for uh, detection of HPV, HPV DNA PCR, amplification of the genome and genotyping is the first molecular test which has been used for more than 30 years. It's a highly sensitive method for HPV detection and has high specificity in fresh tissue. Its advantages are the high sensitivity. It tells you the specific genotype of HPV and it is widely available with many commercially available uh, kits being available commercially. The disadvantages, however, are several because the DNA yield from FFPE tissue specimens may not be optimal and is influenced by factors like formalin concentration, the duration of fixation, the quality of paraffin used and the temperature, all of which can lead to fragmentation of the nucleic acids 
And once the DNA is fragmented be, uh, less than 200 base pairs, it uh, di becomes difficult to detect. The low viral load in FFP samples leads to reduced sensitivity. Contamination is frequent when you have it when you're running a PCR, and it requires technical HPV uh, technical expertise. But most importantly, it can detect passenger HPV DNA as well, and it has low specificity for oncogenically active HPV. HPV E6 E7 mRNA detection by real-time PCR is considered as the research gold standard to diagnose HPV positive or a pharyngeal uh, squamous cell carcinoma when performed on fresh or frozen tissue samples. However, it has low accuracy on FFP tissue because of the higher destruction and fragmentation of RNA, which is more fragile as compared to DNA. It's also a technically demanding procedure and not useful for routine screening. Next, we have the development of the in-situ hybridization techniques. In-situ means in place. So it basically detects the presence of the virus in the tissue section itself. This, this test is based on the hybridization of probes against specific DNA sequences within the tissue. It's relatively inexpensive. It's pathologist friendly because the interpretation is by conventional light microscopy. It has a sensitivity of 80 to 85%. However, the specificity is high. The disadvantages of DNA in situ hybridization are that the results are highly dependent on quality control procedures, experience of the laboratory, false negativity when less than 100 copies of target HPV are present in the tumor cell, significant inter-observer variability in interpretation of the results, and again, most significantly, it does not affect transcriptionally active virus. P16 immunohistochemistry is the most commonly used test, which is widely available. Block positivity, that is nuclear and cytoplasmic staining in more than 70% of the tumor cells, is considered a reliable surrogate marker for transcriptionally active HPV. This is because E7 oncoprotein signaling induces overexpression of P16 ink for it. The advantages of immunohistochemistry are several. It's a cost-effective and practical technique, which is rapid, reproducible, easy to interpret, has a high inter observer agreement. It's easily incorporated into surgical pathology laboratory workflows. It has high sensitivity and specificity. And most importantly, it's an independent predictor of survival with P16 positive tumors having better overall and disease-free survival periods. And it has been stated that P16 immunohistochemistry can obviate the need for HPV mRNA specific testing, which may be limited in availability, is expensive and technically challenging. Let's look at how P16 immunohistochemistry can help us in our routine practice. This is the case of a 65 year old male with a level two cervical lymph node biopsy which shows a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma, which was immunopositive for P16. <coughs> PET CT did not identify any primary site, but once P16 was positive, patient underwent transoral ultrasound assisted bilateral tonsillectomy and base of tongue mucosectomy. The right base of tongue showed a, a one millimeter thick tumor, which was a non keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, immunopositive for P16. And this patient was classified as having a P, uh, pathological stage T1 or, or HPV associated squamous cell carcinoma. So, in this manner, P16, when positive, can help identify the primary site in the oropharynx. However, helpful as it is, there are several caveats to P16 immunohistochemistry. It is a reliable surrogate for HPV only in oropharyngeal cancer with low specificity at other sites. Metastatic non keratinizing squamous cell carcinomas from larynx, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma, and basaloid squamous cell carcinomas of any site can show P16 positivity. The cutoff is very important when we are interpret interpret interpreting P16 immunohistochemistry. And we have to consider that uh, it is positive only when more than 70% of the cells show nuclear and cytoplasmic staining. The clone which is recommended, E6H4, is expensive. It costs about five times that of other clones. So if you're not able to afford it in your lab and you need to validate another clone against it prior to using P16IHC, 
for making treatment decisions. Immunohistochemistry, chemistry, of course, does not tell us about the HPV genotype. Some studies have shown that the survival outcome of HPV 33 uh, positive cancers is worse than that of, the, uh, of HPV-16 positive cancers. So this survival difference cannot be identified if you're using only immunohistochemistry. Most significantly, or uh, uh, to uh, most important in our setting, is that P16 immunohistochemistry has poor sensitivity in low prevalence populations. So what is the prevalence in Indian population? If you look at this, a comprehensive review looking at prevalence of HPV and head and neck cancers across Indian studies, which was published in 2019. There is only a single study which looks at oropharyngeal cancers exclusively, and that is of Bell et al. And they found that the overall positivity was 22%. Excuse me. In this study, they exclusively analyzed 105 patients and found that 86% were males. And uh, HPV prevalence by DNA PCR was 22%. HPV 16 was the most common. It was most frequent in tonsillar squamous cell carcinoma as opposed to other sites in the oropharynx. It was more frequent in patients from urban areas as opposed to rural areas. Median age of patients with HPV positive tumors was eight years younger than those with HPV, num eight, uh, HPV negative tumors. And the mean life, number of lifetime sexual partners and indulgence in high-risk sexual behavior was more frequent in patients with HPV-positive cancers. So here, the demographic profile appears to be similar to that in the Western population. There was no significant association between tobacco, alcohol consumption, and HPV status. HPV-positive uh, patients with HPV-positive tumors did have smoking and, uh, and alcohol consumption. Significantly, most patients had stage 3 and stage 4 disease, and there were no differences between the T stage and N stage of patients with HPV positive and HPV negative cancers. So this is unlike what we see in Western literature, where they have small T, uh, early T stage tumors and high N stage. That was not seen in the Indian population. Uh, subsequently, another study looked at the prognostic value of P16 immunohistochemistry in and the influence of tobacco and oropharyngeal cancers. They had 177 oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas in their study, and they found that 13% were immunopositive for P16. And, uh, but they did find that P16 positive cases had a better overall survival and showed a trend towards improved disease-free survival. So this shows that P16, even in our population, appears to be an independent prognostic marker. Uh, however, uh, another study which looked at uh, head and neck squamous cell carcinomas and leukoplakias, which included 97 oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas, found that while uh, found 7% 7, 7 were P16 positive, and five cases, that is 9%, showed HPV E6, E7 on mRNA-ish. However, only two out of five showed P16 positivity. So they found that there was a poor concordance between HPV testing methods at low prevalence rate. And they stated that P16 immunohistochemistry chemistry is not a good surrogate for high-risk HPV and cannot be used as a standalone test when planning to de-escalate therapy. Our experience has also been similar where more than 50% of P16 positive tumors have been found to be negative by uh, mRNA in situ hybridization. So we really need to uh, uh, look at our P16 positive cases carefully. Uh, next, what we have here is a 55-year female with cervical lymph node metastasis from a non, which looks like a non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. It is in diffusely immunopositive for P16. However, this patient had a primary tumor in the eyelid. So as I mentioned, P16 is not specific for an oropharyngeal primary. We always need to keep this in mind. However, oropharyngeal primaries usually have are the ones which have an undetected primary site with cervical lymph node metastasis, while other sites would have a known primary. Uh, next, we come to these two tumors, which are fairly similar looking. You have a tumor with glandular structures, as well as solid appearing squamoid areas. This was a 42-year male with a base of tongue growth. And this is a case from a 52-year-old female with a base of tongue growth. Again, you have glandular structures, more solid appearing squamoid cells, 
but clearly you have some mucin which is present here. Both of these tumors which were diffusely positive for P16. The first one is an adenosquamous carcinoma, which is known to be HPV associated, whereas mucoepidermoid carcinoma is not associated with HPV, but may show diffuse P16 positivity. So therefore, P16 may be positive even independent of HPV association, and we always need to keep this in mind. Uh, one of the advantages of P16 immunohistochemistry that is you know, stated is that you can uh, identify tumors which don't have definite invasion, right? So this is a patient here with a large cystic lymph node metastasis. And this is the base of tongue mucosectomy, which was performed because there was a slight piquant area in the base of tongue. And here you can see this is the normal mucosa. And here the epithelium appears a bit thickened, a little bit more blue on low part. You can see that there is proliferation of basaloid cells, but absolutely no evidence of invasion. On high magnification, these cells are pretty monotonous looking, but they do have nuclear hyperchromasia and frequent mitosis. There is loss of polarity. So this looks definitely looks abnormal, and we would hope that P16 would come positive and help us out here, but P16 is completely negative. So when you have a population where only about 10 to 15 percent of patients have HPV positive cancers, how do I call this a cancer, right? So P16 doesn't help you out here. Thankfully, we performed P53 here and you can see that P53 is completely positive in the uh, malignant appearing areas. And this patient had lymph node metastasis as well. So it appears that even uh, HPV um, independent squamous cell carcinomas can have this appearance where definite invasion is not seen and they have large lymph node metastasis. And in low prevalence settings, therefore, P16 does not help us in picking up these kind of tumors. Uh, so now coming on to mRNA in situ hybridization, which is uh, the popularity of which has been rising in the last decade. And this uh, technique has high sensitivity and specificity reaching 100% matching that of real-time PCR. The small size of the probes used enables hybridization to partially degrade, degrade mRNA in FFP tissues, and it amplifies a low viral signal by, at, uh, by about 20 times because of the design of the probes. And unlike DNA PCR, there is no risk of contamination as it detects mRNA of HPV, which is already present within the tumor cells in the tissue. The results are read by direct visualization on the light microscope, so it is pathologist friendly. And most importantly, the location of the signal within tumor nuclei indicates transcriptionally active HPV infection. So there are different kinds of probes available which detect the E6, E7 transcripts. You can have a probe that detects only HPV 16, 18, or the one which is, uh, or there is a probe which detects 18 types of high risk H HPV. Automated assays are available, which it is available to be performed on a Ventana machine, similar to immunohistochemistry, and these automated assays have high concordance with manual assays. The disadvantages are that it is a technically demanding procedure and it's expensive. It costs nearly 10,000 rupees as compared to maybe 1,000 rupees for immunohistochemistry. And it does not tell you specifically which high-risk HPV type is present. However, it is at present considered the gold standard assay for detection of HPV on FFP tissue. Uh, this is the design of the probes where you have double Z probes with amplifiers which amplify the signal at least 20 times. So you can uh, either use a brown chromogen where it looks similar to immunohistochemistry or a red chromogen. We initially started off with the brown and then shifted to the red. The red chromogen, however, requires a different mountain, different from a DPX, as it needs to be in an aqueous medium. Multiplex HPV RNA in situ hybridization and P16 immunohistochemistry has been performed and it showed 100% concordance with previous results achieved through the classic P16 immunohistochemistry and HPV RNA scope, which is carried out on two different slides. So we can see that uh, advances are being made in how to improve detection of HPV to get optimal results. Next, we come on to FNAC. Can we detect 
uh, HPV Association on FNAC. This is the case of a 45 year old male with a cast with uh, cervical lymph node metastasis from a carcinoma of unknown primary site. You can see the tumor cells are arranged in loose clusters. And in low magnification, they have this interconnected trabecular and uh, cribriform patterns. Metachromatically staining matrix is seen in some of the tumor fragments, which may be seen in non keratinizing squamous cell carcinomas. Basaloid cells with Scant cytoplasm are seen here, which have uh, round two ovoid nuclei, and there is swirling of these cells within the trabeculae. Cell block preparation also shows a non keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. Immunohistochemistry for P16 was not performed in this case, however, that would help you further. But when you see this morphology, you can predict that the primary may be in the oropharynx. Can HPV testing be performed on FNAC material? FNAC is the ideal method for obtaining diagnostic material from neck node metastasis. However, HPV testing in these specimens has several dilemmas as there are no definite guidelines which have been set down till date and none of the techniques has actually been standardized and they always need internal validation beyond comparison with, with histological specimens. P16 immunohistochemistry chemistry has been tried on cell blocks as well as on direct smears with several studies using cutoffs which range from 1% to 70%. However, most have found that the appropriate cutoff may be around 5 to 15% and that is much lower than that for on, it, on FFP tissue. However, despite this, molecular testing may be required for confirmation. Uh, this study by Wong et al. found that the sensitivity of P16 was around 90% using a cutoff of 1% cells at least, and the sensitivity fell to 38% when using a cutoff of 70%. However, they found that mrna -ish had very high sensitivity in comparison with HPV, DNA, PCR on corresponding for FFP tissues. And they've said that mrna -ish is a better technique for detection of HPV in uh, FNAC specimens. Cytopathology laboratories have begun to investigate the application of commercially available molecular tests, HPV tests, which are approved for detection of HPV in cervical cancer screening to be used in head and squamous cell carcinomas, including the Roche Cobas, the Hybrid Capture 2, Servista, Aptima, and such tests. Although the sensitivity and specificity of these tests are high, None of these have been specifically validated on oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma metastasis for routine clinical practice. Uh, several new biomarkers for HPV positive oropharyngeal cancers are being explored and detection of HPV DNA in plasma with new ultrasensitive methods appears to have generated interest in recent years. Droplet di uh, digital PCR assays have been reported to correlate with clinical outcome and aid in early detection of recurrence in post-treatment monitoring. This is a quantitative method with high sensitivity, accuracy, and reproducibility. So we're looking at newer techniques which are going to be coming up in the near future. Uh, we also have radiomic features on CT scans which can predict HPV status on the corresponding pathology tissue specimens. So it's likely that maybe a decade later, we wouldn't even need to detect it because it would be detected by radiomics and artificial intelligence. Next, we come on to a case of a 55-year-old male with erythroplakia in the left buccal mucosa. You can see that the mucosa is quite hyperplastic with hyperkeratosis, and there is an irregular proliferation of the red ridges, which is seen here. Definite architectural atypia with irregular elongation and a proliferation of basaloid cells as also seen here, there is a lack of maturation of the squamous cells as you reach the surface. On higher magnification, you can see several karyorectic cells where you have a condensed hyperchromatic nucleus surrounded by a clear halo, as well as apoptotic keratinocytes. And the superficial layers of the epithelium show the presence of coilocytes with uh, irregular resinoid nuclei and a clear halo surrounding them. So with all of these features, we decided to perform P16 immunohistochemistry. And sure enough, in the areas that looked abnormal, there was diffuse block positivity for P16. And this was a case of HPV-associated oral dysplasia. 
This refers to the distinctive viral cytopathic changes caused by transcriptionally active high-risk HPV, most frequently HPV-16. These cases have a risk of progression to squamous cell carcinoma, about 5 to 15% of cases. They're most frequently seen on the ventral or lateral aspect of the tongue, followed by floor of mouth and buccal mucosa, and are rare on the palatal, gingival, and lip mucosa. These uh, HPV-associated oral dysplasia usually presents as a white to red patch, which is usually flat and demarcated. However, on occasion, it can be raised and nodular in appearance. It's most, more frequent in males with a wide age distribution with a peak in the sixth decade of life. The typical features that are described include the presence of parakeratotic epithelium, which may occasionally show orthokeratosis, there's marked architectural and cytological changes of dysplasia. There's a monotonous population of basaloid keratinocytes having high NC ratio, nuclear pleomorphism, and superficial keratinocytes. The two characteristic cell types described are a characteristic cells with condensed coarse chromatin and a pericellular halo as seen here, as well as apoptotic cells with condensed pink cytoplasm, dense eosinophilic cytoplasm. And this is uh, now a new entity which is included in the fifth edition of the WHO classification. On P16 immunohistochemistry, you can see diffuse staining in a continuous band which is sharply demarcated from the adjacent non-dysplastic epithelium. And it is usually seen in about 50% of the epithelial thickness, excluding the keratin layer. However, this finding needs further validation as there are very few studies which are describing the, the presence of oral dysplasia, which is P16 positive. By molecular testing by DNA or mRNA in situ hybridization can demonstrate the presence of HPV, DNA, or mRNA within the epithelial cells. And DNA PCR can also be used to identify the type of HPV that is causing the dysplasia. Next, we come to a tumor in a 46-year-old male with a tumor in the nasal cavity. This was a large tumor which was in, uh, destroying the nasal septum and was protruding out of the nostril of the patient. On low magnification, you can see that there is a tumor which is uh, arranged in uh, irregular nests and islands. There's no evident keratinization on low part. In some areas, it appeared to have pushing margins, uh, borders, but then on higher magnification, you could see that there was infiltration into the my, uh, minor salivary glands, as well as infiltration into skeletal muscle fibers. The back-to-back the -back epithelial islands did not have any dysmoplastic stroma between them and showed central comedonecrosis. On higher magnification, the cells had a monotonous appearance with moderate amount of amphosphilic cytoplasm. There was a condensation of cells towards the periphery of the islands, giving this appearance here. At places, there were the cells were more spindle in appearance and peripheral palisading where the cells were uh, uh, adjacent to the basement membrane. Here you can appreciate the peripheral palisading better and there are some more ovoid and elongated nuclei while the others are round in appearance. This tumor was diffusely P16 positive and mRNA in situ hybridization showed the presence of high risk HPV. So this was a case of sinonasal HPV associated squamous cell carcinoma. The sinonasal tract is a less common site for squamous cell carcinoma and uh, which is a diverse disease with numerous unusual and distinct histological and molecular subtypes. Multiple etiologies have been included, uh, have been uh, implicated in, in sinonasal squamous cell carcinomas, of which high-risk HPV is the most recent. And evidence supports the role of high-risk high HPV in a subset of sinonasal squamous cell carcinoma, while low-risk HPV is involved in pathogenesis of inverted papillomas, a small proportion of which transform to squamous cell carcinomas. So it is basically found that there are two pathways. One is a pathway to, uh, from inverted papilloma to squamous cell carcinoma, which is related to EGFR mutations, and a second pathway to de novo squamous cell carcinoma in which high-risk HPV plays a role. So th uh, these tumors are frequently non-keratinizing in uh, morphology, and HPV-16 has been implicated 
However, the distinctiveness of this entity, its epidemiology, its to pathological features, and whether it has an improved clinical outcome needs to be established further before it can be defined as a distinct entity. Uh, Basaloid squamous cell carcinoma, papillary squamous cell carcinoma, and adenosquamous carcinoma in the nasal cavity have also been found to harbor high risk HPV. HPV positive swinonasal squamous cell carcinoma has shown a trend towards improved clinical outcomes, but as I said, this needs further validation before it is recognized as a distinct entity. Next, we come on to two cyanonasal tumors which had very similar morphology with cribriform, trabecular pattern, and the presence of myxoid appearing basement membrane material. You can see both these tumors have this sort of appearance. This doesn't have too much crib reforming, but trabecular pattern interconnected trabeculae with this myxoid uh, matrix present between the tumor cells. Both of these tumors are diffusely positive for P16. We performed based on the histomorphological features, we thought is this adenoid cystic carcinoma, uh, uh, and we performed MYB uh, rearrangement of fish. Here you can see a break apart in the signals where this is one fuse signal and one split signal indicating a rearrangement of the MYB gene. So the first case was an adenoid cystic carcinoma. However, the second case showed normal uh, two fused yellow signals in, uh, indicating that MYB rearrangement was not present. So then uh, this tumor looking at its morphology you can see that there is a tubular trabecular pattern, a lot of uh, myxoid material in between these uh, spaces, a uh, prominent trabecular pattern in some areas, some vague uh, cribri forming pattern, not, not the punched out spaces that you see in adenoid cystic carcinoma though, but somewhat akin to it, and some solid areas where you can see that the tumor cells have moderate amount of cytoplasm. The nuclei are angulated and hypochromatic, similar to adenoid cystic carcinoma, but the presence of this much cytoplasm is unusual for adenoid cystic carcinoma. Here you can see that this is the surface epithelium, pseudocytified ciliated columnar epithelium, and the tumor is in continuation with this epithelial surface, whereas in these areas you can see that this is the surface metaplastic squamous epithelium, and the tumor is in continuation here as well. So this is basically, it looks kind of like a, uh, an adenoid cystic carcinoma, but it is in continuity with the surface epithelium. Let's look at the immunohistochemistry. Uh, CK7, EMA, and CD117 all stain the luminal cells, while the abluminal cells are stained by smooth muscle actin, P40, similar to adenoid cystic carcinoma. However, when we performed MRMA in situ hybridization, you can see that there are a few small red dots here indicating the presence of high-risk HPV. So the viral load here appears to be quite low. And this was, however, a case of HPV-related multiphenotypic cyanonasal carcinoma. This is a higher magnification. You can appreciate the dots that are present, the red dots that are present within the nuclei of the tumor cells. And these images are both from the same case. So HPV-related multiphenotypic cyanonasal carcinoma is a new distinct entity described in the cyanonasal region. It is an HPV-positive carcinoma with histopathological appearance similar to that of solid adenoid cystic carcinoma, and it can have a tubule uh, and cribriform architecture as well. It affects the nasal cavity and shows female uh, predominance. It is characterized by multiple lineages of morphological and or immunohistochemical differentiation, that is myoepithelial, ductal, squamous, and sarcomatoid. And it has been postulated that it originates from a terminal excretory duct of the underlying seromucinous glands at the transition with the surface epithelium, which is why it demonstrates all of these phenotypes. And dysp dysplasia may be present in the overlying epithelium. These tumors have a distinct molecular signature Although they morphologically are similar to adenoid cystic carcinoma, MYB, MYB L1, and NFIB gene fusions are absent. They are P16 positive and show presence of high risk HPV type 33, which can be demonstrated by mRNA in situ hybridization and rarely HPV 35. 
So if you use a probe, mRNA-ish probe, which only detects HPV 16 and 18, you would not pick this up. But if you pick the use the probe, which detects all 18 types, then only then would you identify this on mRNA-ish. It is important to diagnose these tumors accurately because they have an indolent clinical course as compared to adenoid cystic carcinoma. Local recurrence does occur, but lymph node metastasis does not occur and very rare distant metastasis has been described. What is important to note here is that adenoid cystic carcinoma can also show diffuse P16 positivity. So we need an HPV specific molecular test to distinguish between adenoid cystic carcinoma and multi-phenotypic cyanonasal carcinoma. Here are the histological features once again. It can have solid architecture, cribriform architecture and tubular patterns looking very similar to adenoid cystic carcinoma. And it is diffusely positive for P16 as well and shows uh, mRNA-ish positivity as seen here. Next is a case of a 55-year-old female with a lacrimal sac tumor. This is the epithelium of the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium of the lacrimal sac. And there is a tumor here which has solid architecture. It is uh, abutting the bone, the lacrimal bone, and it is infiltrating the dermis of the skin of the, uh, adjacent to the medial canthus. So you can see here that there are monotonous sheets of monotonous cells. At places, they are arranged in interconnected trabeculae. You can see here that where there are these fibrocollagenous septi, the tumor cells show some palisading and streaming in other areas. On higher magnification, these cells appear undifferentiated, monotonous with hyperchromatic or round to ovoid nuclei and appear a little more spindled at places. So we are seeing a pattern over here. All of these tumors tend to look quite similar. Focally, keratinization was identified in this tumor. And the lymph node metastasis showed large cystic, showed a non keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma with large cystic areas. And this tumor was again immunopositive for P16. So, HPV related ocular adnexal squamous cell carcinoma is another entity that we need to keep our eyes open for. What is important to note here is that the lacrimal drainage system, the most common tumor that is seen here, is squamous cell carcinoma. And all of the uh, different uh, uh, the new entities that have emerged from poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinomas of the nasal cyanonasal region can be identified in the lacrimal drainage system. So we have seen cases of nut carcinoma, cases of a uh, case of decaf2 carcinoma arising in the lacrimal sac region. And also here now we have a case of HPV associated squamous cell carcinoma. Apart from the lacrimal drainage system, the eyelid is also another site, site where HPV-associated squamous cell carcinoma can occur. However, uh, the role of HPV in these tumors is still uncertain due to their rarity. Only four studies have assessed the association of HPV in lacrimal drainage system squamous cell carcinomas. In one study, they detected in nearly 90% by HPV DNA PCR, but RNA-ish was not performed. And in one study where RNA-ish was performed, none of the cases which were uh, which showed HPV DNA had uh, uh, had a positivity on mRNA-ish. So further studies are required to decide the role and causality of HPV in lacrimal drainage system carcinomas. As I mentioned, eyelid squamous cell carcinomas can also show HPV positivity. So the most important, the most frequent risk factors are UV radiation and immunosuppression. And HPV is responsible for uh, eyelid squamous cell carcinoma in only a small proportion of cases. And we recently identified two cases of eyelid squamous cell carcinoma, which were P16 positive and demonstrated high risk HPV on mRNA-ish, which is an important finding because the causality of HPV in eyelid squamous cell carcinoma is still uncertain because it is believed that many genotypes of HPV with cutaneous tropism are commensals. But now, as we have demonstrated it on mRNA-ish, that indicates that it is transcriptionally active virus, establishing that HPV-related squamous cell carcinoma of the eyelid does exist. So subsequent to identifying these two cases, we evaluated all cases of eyelid squamous cell 
carcinoma diagnosed at our ocular pathology division over one year. Six cases out of 20 showed positive or equivocal P16 staining. Equivocal is 50 to 70% of tumor cells being positive. And mRNA-ish was negative in four of six cases. In two cases, we didn't have tissue. So it's out of all the tw uh, 22 cases, two cases were HPV positive. Interestingly, the cases which were P16 positive but mRNA-ish negative all had keratinizing histology. So it's important that the non-keratinizing histology is most likely what is associated with HPV here as well. So this is one of the cases. It was from a 65-year-old female. You can see the typical morphology here as well. The interconnected trabeculae and uh, blue appearing tumor monotonous cells with hyperchromatic nuclei, amphiphilic cytoplasm. We don't need to see any more of it. It looks pretty similar to the previous cases, right? And it's diffusely P16 positive and mRNA-ish is positive as well. So to conclude, HPV-associated head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is seen in the oropharynx, which is the prototypical site with tonsil and base of tongue being affected most commonly. Other sites in the head and neck include sinonasal squamous cell carcinoma, sinonasal uh, um, HPV-associated multiphenotypic carcinoma, carcinomas with unknown primary sites, and ocular and neck cell squamous cell carcinoma. Oral epithelial dysplasia is also an emerging entity and more data is needed on this. We don't know the incidence of the definite incidence of this in India right now. On histology, most of these tumors have a blue cell appearance with endophytic ribbon-like uh, trabeculae, round, well-demarcated necks, nests, and maybe papillary exophytic growth. The proliferation of tumor cells is that of immature squamous epithelium lacking keratinization in most cases. Tumor cells have INC ratio, nuclear atypia, mitosis, and apoptotic activity. They tend to palisade with cells perpendicular to the underlying basement membrane and fibrocollagenous septi. Central necrosis is seen in the nest and there's minimal desmoplastic stroma. So these features are common to all of them except for uh, multiphenotypic sinonasal carcinoma. Several techniques are available for detection of HRHPV and FFP tissue and cytological material. But what we need to remember is that guidelines from Western high prevalence populations may not be readily applicable to Indian patients. P16 immunohistochemistry chemistry is most commonly used and easily available. While it has high sensitivity, it lacks specificity. And mRNA is the gold standard technique for FFP tissue. So probably an algorithmic approach with P16 IHC followed by reflex mRNA-ish testing in P16 positive cases is a cost-effective method which may be ideal for routine practice, which is what we, perf uh, we perform at AIMS. When should we test a case uh, tumor for a high-risk HPV? All primary oropharyngeal cancers, metastatic oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma if the HPV status is not det determined at the primary site, all cups with squamous cell carcinoma at level two and three, at other levels as well if they show non-keratinizing morphology. Sinonasal tumors which have adenoid cystic carcinoma-like morphology, here P16 is not sufficient. You have to perform a specific molecular test for HPV. And in other sites as well, in the head and neck, when you see non-keratinizing histology and it is P16 positive, you might want to perform MRI molecular test to confirm HPV association. Why do we need to know the HPV status? Because it informs clinical management and tre treatment decisions for patients with head and neck cancer. It aids in risk stratification because these tumors have an overall favorable prognosis and efforts are being targeted towards de-escalation of treatment intensity and HPV-positive cancer with the intent to reduce toxicity of radiation and chemotherapy. And to determine patient eligibility for clinical trials for investigating new treatment modalities and regimens in these patients, we need to identify the HPV status. And then uh, HPV positivity in metastatic squamous cell carcinoma of unknown primary to cervical lymph node strongly points to the site of oropharynx to the site of origin as the oropharynx. Also, it is necessary to identify epidemiological trends. We cannot uh, just extrapolate uh, Western find, uh, findings from Western literature to the Indian population. And lastly, it is important for counseling and patient education purposes regarding the etiology of their cancers.
uh, social media has a lot going on these days. You can see that the updated CAP guidelines for HPV testing and head and neck cancers are being developed, and we can look for updates on the same soon. Uh, I'd like to conclude here and thank uh, with acknowledgement to my head and neck oncology team and my uh, research fellows who perform mRNA-ish testing in my lab. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ranjal, for that wonderful uh, and elaborate uh, talk covering all the aspects uh, and sharing uh, those beautiful cases which were worked up till the molecular uh, level also. Uh, there are uh, many questions in the Q&A box. Uh, Rajan, sir, can I? Yeah, yeah I think uh, more than 20 questions are there. So yesterday we actually took a decision. Uh, we can type the answer right? like that. Okay, one by one. Uh, you can read out some uh, one, two or three questions, which can be answered. Yes, yes. many. Yeah, many yeah, of them have a few questions here, and I'll answer the rest in the chat box. Yes, Dr. Anshay. Um, many of them have been answered by you over the course of the lecture. So I will skip all those. Uh, but one main re recurring question, uh, which has come from many of the uh, attendees are, uh, how do you decide on reflex testing for a HPV specific testing after uh, doing a P16 uh, testing in a case? And when do you uh, recommend or what are the scenarios? So uh, we routinely perform mRNA-ish in all P16 positive cases. And uh, knowing that this is an expensive test, it may not be possible to for all laboratories and setups to perform mRNA-ish in all P16 positive cases. I think uh, what can be done is that if a tumor has keratinizing morphology, then you should definitely perform mRNA-ish because in a, uh, in a non-keratinizing morphology, the morphology corresponds to what is known for HPV-positive squamous cell carcinoma, whereas a keratinizing morphology is unusual. So when you have keratinizing morphology, that is one situation in which you should definitely perform a molecular test for confirmation. Uh, then if you have a carcinoma of unknown primary site, and if it is going to alter the surgical management, as in if you're going to uh, do a base of tongue mucosectomy and tonsillectomy based entirely on whether it is on it being P16 positive, then you might want to do get a confirm molecular confirmation as it's going to alter the surgical procedure. Again, uh, then next, if you have carcinoma of unknown primary site in levels other than level two and three, then you, especially in uh, lower levels like level four, then you should definitely do uh, mrna -ish in those cases. Uh, you can have hypopharyngeal cancers and, uh, you know, uh, which are clinically undetectable and can present as metastasis from unknown primary site. So uh, if, and they can be P16 positive and have non-keratinizing morphology. So in such a situation, you would want to do mrna -ish to localize the tumor. Okay, and uh, there is one question regarding uh, in similar uh, context. Should a P16 a positive case uh, be followed by mRNA-ish? And what about P16 negative cases? Uh, uh, in what all scenario, P16 negative, you tend to go and uh, do a, a specific testing? So in P16 negative cases, we do not routinely perform mRNA-ish because uh, it is, um, one, it is a te technically challenging test. It is expensive to perform and at least half of our uh, 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 oropharyngeal cancers have non-keratinizing morphology, whereas P16 positivity, if you look at the data from India, only about 15 to 20% at max are HPV positive. 
So you are going to get non-keratinizing carcinomas, which are P16 negative, right? So you know that the prevalence is low. So you don't want to go and test all of them. Now, the thing is, as of now, we only use P16 for prognostication. We are not altering the management based on the, uh, the for the management is not altered based on the P16 status. However, if it is a sitting, setting of a clinical trial where you're looking at HPV positive versus negative tumors, then if it is P16 negative, you would want to still go ahead and do your molecular test because there the treatment would be altered. Yes. Then another context is experience of P16 IHC on cell blocks. Anything you want? We have not really, uh, we have done it in few cases, but I personally, I'm not happy with the results. And uh, there is no defined cutoff as yet that, you know, so uh, what should be the cutoff for the positivity in cell blocks? And uh, if anybody else has better experience than that, I would be happy to know. But definitely, I as of now, we do not uh, recommend P16 immunohistochemistry on cell blocks. There are studies where we have done it on direct smears as well and found good results and good correlation with uh, P16 positive uh, state results on histology. But I think interpretation would be extremely difficult and with a lot of inter-observer variability. So I think we need robust data from the Indian population to actually, you know, say whether it is a valid method for HPV detection. Okay. Another uh, question uh, is about, you mentioned about the uh, clone, specific clone, which is costly. And when other clones are being used, uh, validation is advocated. Uh, any, um, how to go about the validation? So then uh, you would have to take a small number of cases in which you do the clone that you want to use and do also use the E6H4 clone and compare the results to see that you get similar results. So there is a published study by uh, Dr. Jim Lewis, I think in which three clones were compared and that is the way to go about it, I guess, if you want to validate a different antibody against the E6H4 clone. Okay. Uh, Smitha ma'am? Yes. We stop here. Yes, okay. okay. Rest, uh, I think. Dr. Yes, Anshin I'll take be... the rest of the questions in the chat box. Yeah, you can answer the question in the chat box, please. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the Kerala chapter for uh, making me a part of this uh, webinar series also before signing in. Thank you, Dr. Anshit. Thank you so much. Doc, uh, thank you, Dr. Anshit and Dr. Smitha for this wonderful session. So we'll move on to the uh, last talk of this session. Um, so I invite Dr. S. Shangar, sir, to introduce the speaker for this session. Sir is currently working as the principal, Government Medical College, Kottayam. He was a professor and HOD of Department of Pathology at Government Medical College, Kottayam, and as well as in uh, Trivandrum. Sir has more than 30 years of experience in his belt. Currently, sir is a dean faculty of Allied Health Science, Kuhas, Academy Council Senate and Planning Committee member. So as an advisory committee member to academic staff college and School of Public Health and Policy Kuhas. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Annie and Rajan. Mm, it's a wonderful evening, having listened to a wonderful talk. Uh, without wasting much time, uh, let me get to my business. It's a very great pleasure and honor for me to introduce Dr. S. V. Kani, our next speaker. To the members of IAPM of Kerala chapter, she's a very well-known oncopathologist in India and abroad. Madam has worked in TMH for more than 40 years with more than 250 articles and 15 book chapters. Her areas of specialities include Hellenic pathology, gynec, cytopathology, and neuro-oncology, and she's trained in oncopathology from USA. Uh, Madam is an excellent teacher. I have heard her many talks in, in the IAPM. And she's also a good pioneer in, in introducing newer technologies to, to the Indian people, especially the techniques like uh, EBUS, TBNA, ROSE, uh, techniques in EM, telepathology, synoptic reporting, and whatnot. 
from such an excellent speaker we are going to see the other side of the page we have been listening to the the pharmacal carcinomas which are p16 pos uh, which are p16 positive or hp positive there is the other big group of undifferentiated cyanonasal this enigmatic tumors which are very aggressive which is lot of multi modality form of therapy to survive uh, rather an uninteresting histology maybe and maybe even an etiology but a very interesting molecular basis uh, what is this mystery uh, let's hear uh, from this uh, expert dr uh, sb kane about a, a rather an algorithmic approach to to somehow classify this mysterious uh, disease of cyanonasal undifferentiated tumors over to you madam thank you very much thanks a lot dr shankar it's really a pleasure to be associated with uh, kerala chapter and uh, i would like to thank the organizers of kerala chapter dr rajan dr shankar dr anila and uh, her team uh, for inviting me and uh, giving me this topic which is of great interest to me one of my favorite topic and without again much uh, delay i would like to start just a minute i want to see my face you know yes yeah so my talk has already been um, told to you is a algorithmic approach to undifferentiated and also poorly differentiated cyanonasal tumors now it's really a very large one after the wonderful talk wonderful and informative talk by uh, dr anchal mine will be really practical talk and i would like to share my experience what i have collected in tata hospital over many years so i just wanted to request the organizers since i am starting almost maybe 20 minutes late at least i'll be given 15 more minutes beyond the stipulated time if i finish early it is well and good but otherwise please give me that time so before actually i start with the cases you know real uh, i want to tell you something about the cyanonasal tumors they offer not only the clinical diagnostic challenges but also the uh, pathological diagnostic challenges and why because they account only for 3% of head neck malignancy they usually are advanced stage at presentation because they do not have specific symptoms all these tumors irrespective of their pathology etiology they present with the few symptoms only that is swelling nasal blockage nasal bleed that's it so even a papilloma or a polyp will present with these symptoms when they uh, they present in advanced stage they show involvement of the vital structure around like orbit or intracranial fossa the imaging modality which is so much of help at other sites is of limited help in this particular area because because after telling you what is the epicenter of the mass they can rarely offer further information as to the pathology of the lesion there is no tumor marker and besides the access is very difficult so the surgeon or the clinician always lands up giving you inadequate tumor tissue so that all these result in delay in the diagnosis so this is about the clinical challenges these are followed by pathological challenges because these are diverse complex and rare tumors so you know there are limited number of cases seen by each pathologist in his tenure the tissue is also limited the differential diagnosis is wide and we'll see see to it in the next uh, few minutes the experience also is relatively limited there are confusing terminologies newly described rare entities as you can see now who classification in almost at all sites is expanding year by year and these tumors are of diverse origin with they show histological diversity and overlapping morphology all this result in you know difficulty or challenging cases and histopathology still remains a gold standard so majority of the times pathologists are in the hot seat because the onus of diagnosis rest on them so what is this diversity of tumors that relates to the histogenesis as well as morphology there are epithelial tumors spindle cell round cell and undifferentiated tumors 
Now you will say every site will have these tumors, but what is unique to uh, sinonasal region is the undifferentiated tumor forms a large group as compared to epithelial, spindle, and round cell. They are not only complex, they are confusing. And within undifferentiated tumors, you get a lot of variety. So almost every alternate tumor is undifferentiated or poorly differentiated. Those who regularly deal with sinonasal will agree with me that very rarely you will get straightforward squamous cell carcinoma or adenoid cystic carcinoma, grade one or two, which really don't require any immunohistochemistry for diagnosis. Now this diagram will tell you one of the reasons. You know, epithelial tumors can appear round cell in sinonasal regions when they are either SNUC, that is undifferentiated carcinoma, neuroendocrine carcinoma, nut midline carcinoma. Epithelial tumors can also appear spindly, sarcomatoid carcinoma, spindle cell melanoma. So also uh, round cell tumors like rhabdomyosarcoma can appear spindly and a sinovial sarcoma, which is usually spindle shaped can be poorly differentiated, so on and so forth. And therefore, this becomes a uh, challenging for pathologists. So let's start with what are the undifferentiated tumors. You can have a neuroectodermal tumors, epithelial tumors, round cell, and some of the newly described tumors. Obviously, I wouldn't be able to touch or cover all these, but my idea is to tell you the philosophy about any pathologist, a surgical pathologist, when he sees any undifferentiated, polydifferentiated tumors, how he should go about and how he should order the immunohistochemistry. Now, in my talk, I always make it clear that those institutes who do not have immunohistochemistry, which are you know, reducing in number day by day, always feel that it is so easy to diagnose with the help of immunohistochemistry, more the merrier. But contrary to this belief, we realize that when you have a lot of immuno, it becomes a, really a difficult task to decide which immuno panel has to be employed for which undifferentiated tumor. So I will present some cases and discuss the diagnostic approach with the immunohistochemistry panels. So that is the main idea. So this is the basic algorithmic approach. Whenever you get a case, you see what is the clinical presentation, which is not going to help in uh, sinonasal tumors. But yes, you can basically make two classes, the one which are rapidly growing, which are going to be high-grade tumors. Majority of them will be undifferentiated. In contrast, which are relatively slow-growing tumors, which are going to be very benign or can be low-grade malignancy. Then, of course, biopsy will be done. You see, first biopsy is adequate, then offer broad histologic diagnosis. There is no point offering pinpoint diagnosis in sinonasal region, except as I mentioned, squamous carcinoma and adenoid cystic carcinoma. You have to order immunohistochemistry and in panel. So what do you do with primary immunohistochemistry panel after employing the primary immunohistochemistry? Which will, have, uh, which will be composed of sensitive markers, you will be able to give broad typing of cancer. That means at least you will segregate epithelial from non-epithelial tumors. Then narrow down differential diagnosis, what you had offered on the biopsy. Then secondary immunostochemistry panel, which you will try to attain a specific tumor typing. And then lastly, there will be tertiary immunohistochemistry panel, which is essentially to confirm the diagnosis which you have already made with the secondary panel. So you have to go very systematically to crack the challenging cases. And remember, you always start with the sensitive markers. And as you go down, more and more specific markers have to be introduced. So this gives you broad uh, idea about what is the spectrum of the epithelial malignancy. Squamous carcinoma, very few, but in that also you get keratinizing, non-keratinizing, basaloid, adenocarcinoma, which again are of different types and I'm not going to touch them. Sinonasal adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma of salivary origin, intestinal type of adenocarcinoma. And then you have a large group of non-squamous, non-adenocarcinoma. So in fact, whenever you see any epithelial tumor, you have to first rule out these two, even though you do not subtype, and then only you discuss about non-squamous, non-adenocarcinoma, which will include neuroendocrine carcinoma, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, nut midline carcinoma, sinonasal teratocarcinosarcoma, and various new entities which are basically aggressive carcinoma. 
I'm sorry, this part is not seen. Uh, can you see it on your screen? The lateral part is not seen. So now we'll discuss the cases. 55 year old female who presented with swelling and nasal bleed for four months on examination and even on radiology, there was nasoethmoid mass. So if there is a short history of four months, it is likely to be high grade. If on radiology, you see intracranial fossa involvement, orbital involvement, then it is going to be an aggressive tumor. So look at this tumor. What can you see here? Basically, tumor is made up of nest. Okay, the tumor cell type is basaloid. There are very many basaloid uh, tumors, which we'll come to it a little later. Once you say basaloid, you try to see whether the border is well-defined and whether there is a palisading. You can see trabeculae also. In the background, there is a lymphocytic infiltrate and you feel as if there is a lot of degeneration and necrosis happening here. So at this level, it appears high grade, but we will see further. Now, somewhere it is a little bit more cytoplasm is uh, seen in this particular area, whereas most of the tumor appears very blue and there is a fibrous stroma with infiltration of inflammatory cells. Note absence of squamous and glandular differentiation. That is the first step you have to do. The pattern, nest, compactly arranged cells, basaloid type, but no differentiation. Okay. And there was no obvious palisading in these at least pictures and the stroma is desmoplastic. So what differential diagnosis you would consider? Of course, basal oil squamous carcinoma, then you will look for focal abrupt squamous differentiation, which was not seen here. HPV associated carcinoma, which is multi-phenotypic and you will get some areas which will be squamoid, some will be adenoid cystic like. Now, Dr. Anchal has already covered this part. Now, we feel that adenoid cystic carcinoma is easy to diagnose because we see cribriform spaces. But remember, high-grade adenoid cystic carcinoma will be solid and will not show you cribriform spaces, particularly on the biopsy. So again, this comes in the differential diagnosis because then the cells look very small. We have smart human deficient basaloid carcinoma, which may or may not show rhabdoid or plasmacytoid cells. And you have SNEC, that is neuroendocrine carcinoma. And um, and out of these variety of carcinomas, it is uh, HPV associated carcinoma and basal or squamous carcinoma, which can show you in situ carcinoma in the overlying epithelium. But again, in a biopsy, you may not get to see the overlying epithelium. Now, the question is how should we construct the immunostochemistry panel? Of course, first, some epithelial markers have to be done. This is CK, this is EMA, these are vessels which are negative, and P63, which is an important marker for many aspects, but firstly, to distinguish squamous and maybe some of the salivary gland tumors from non-squamous, non, non adeno Now, remember in sinonasal tract, though, though adenocarcinoma is of varied types, the most common type of adenocarcinoma is of salivary type, and most common salivary type tumor is adenoid cystic carcinoma. So now with CK EMA positivity, you only know that it is a epithelial tumor or poorly differentiated carcinoma, you have to go further with the second panel of immunohistochemistry. So we thought that we will give one synapto, one P16, and one marker, seek it, INI1, to you know go further to find out what is its lineage. And lo and behold, the INA was lost. So this clinched our diagnosis very easily because all the other markers were negative. So Synapto was asked basically for neuroendocrine, P16 for uh, HPV associated, CK for adenoid cystic and I9. So you choose and select as per your primary differential diagnosis. And then you ask the second panel of immunohistochemistry. Now remember every time you are not going to clinch the diagnosis in the second panel. Suppose I9 one was not uh, uh, you know, included in the second panel these three would have come negative. And then the third panel, you would have included INI1. So there is no harm reaching up to the third panel, but you must get the diagnosis by the end of the third panel. So this is how we are cracked to the first case of uh, INI uh, deficient uh, carcinoma of sinonasal tract. We go to the another tumor, again, elderly male with nasoethmoid mass. And this one on radiology showed intracranial extension and this was of short duration. So obviously this was also 
a high grade tumor now see the difference as compared to the previous one again there are nest but here they appear little loosely cohesive lot of degenerating cells they are not basaloid the cytoplasm is there the cells are uh, you know appear to be uh, hyperchromat nuclei show hyperchromatism little bit pleomorphism and not mitotic activity is easily seen in this you know a smaller area it is not even one uh, not even a hypomorphism and one area showed this comedo type of necrosis now uh, many students feel comedo type of necrosis is very specific features but it is seen in many high grade tumors so that really doesn't help you uh, be, be, besides saying that this is high grade tumor so what was our primary panel again ck ema p63 and synaptopsin and let me tell you this is going to be the common primary panel in undifferentiated or purely differentiated synonasal tumors which are not spindle cells i have not included spindle cell tumors in this group on higher magnification looking at the closely the slides what we found where there were hyperchromatic pleomorphic nuclei with lot of central apoptosis this loose area is because of breaking of the cells forming apoptotic bodies so in this area necrosis was not seen it was localized to only one area again on closer look the nuclei are pleomorphic and you can see prominent nucleoli and there is condensed chromatin around mitosis was seen as i said okay apoptosis was also seen so it is a high grade tumor showing ck and ema positivity so it is uh, carcinoma we did ini1 it was retained and we also did synaptopsin which was focally positive as you can see here you know it is not a good positivity to label it as a neuroendocrine but we'll come to it little later how do you classify synonasal neuroendocrine carcinoma so in this case our second panel was actually chromogranin nut antigen eberish and ini1 so i am showing this second panel cases first was ckema and p63 synapto was positive one synapto is positive you have to do chromogranin to know whether it is a neuroendocrine tumor or some other tumor nut antigen because again it was a high grade and uh, pleomorphism was seen eberish for nasopharyngeal undifferentiated carcinoma and ini1 also so here we saw only synaptopsin positivity but chromogranin was negative so we could label it as synonasal undifferentiated carcinoma so when we think about neuroectodermal tumors uh, or neuroepithelial tumors in synonasal basically we think about three tumors olfactory neuroblastoma neuroendocrine and undifferentiated carcinoma so snuc is more epithelial and less neuronal whereas onb is more neuronal and less epithelial so it can show focal ck positivity but it does not show ema positivity whereas other two tumors which are epithelial can show both ck and ema positivity that's why we prefer to do ck and ema also now this is a spectrum of poly differentiated carcinoma i am not going through it only to know that spectrum is very big and unique for synonasal tract now snuc is considered as a aggressive tumor which usually involves the nasoethmoid region male predominance always short dissolution advanced stage at presentation with intracranial extension so when you have a intracranial extension and a uh, less than 6 months of duration is going to be an aggressive tumor now this one uh, shows epithelial differentiation but it lacks famous glandular neuroectodermal neuroendocrine mesenchymal and melanocytic differentiation that's why it is called snuc but abortive neuroendocrine differentiation can be seen basically on immunohistochemistry or electron microscopy so differential diagnosis includes nasopharyngeal and differentiated carcinoma poly differentiated non keratinizing squamous cell olfactory neuroblastoma which is high grade remember grade 1 and grade 2 olfactory neuroblastoma can be easily identified on morphology it may not need immunohistochemistry because it is most differentiated around cell tumor whereas synonasal neuroendocrine carcinoma naturally leads immunohistochemistry to show that this is of neuroendocrine origin and nut midline carcinoma also needs immunohistochemistry to diagnose it 
So uh, by immunohistochemistry, this particular tumor will show CK EMR diffuse positivity. CK7 and 8 also will be positive. NAC synaptophysin, if positive, will be focal. And you will not get three, four neuroendocrine markers positivity. And it has been shown recently that in more than 80% of cases, you will get IDH2 or IDH1 mutation, the most common mutation being IDH2 R172. Now, there is, we have written an article from Tata Memorial Hospital where we have uh, given you how to distinguish this type of sinonasal malignancies. So here we see typical sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, which needs to be distinguished from nasopharyngeal uh, type of undifferentiated carcinoma. Look at morphology is different. You know, here the nuclei will be oval, smooth uh, outline. They will not be pleomorphic. Nucleus will be pale, and there will be prominent nucleoli. So it is not sufficient to see whether the tumor cells have prominent nucleoli. What is the chromatin content? How is the border? There are so many other things which have to be taken into account. But let me clarify here, you do not heavily rely on morphology. Morphology has to be supported with immunohistochemistry. Now, when you are considering nasopharyngeal, you look for syncytial cells, vesicular, prominent nucleoli, and of course, lymphocyte, lympho and plasma cell masking the tumor cells. Necrosis can be rarely seen in this, whereas necrosis is usually seen in SNUC. And we can always distinguish with the help of immunohistochemistry. CK56 will be for and P63 will be positive here. And with Iberish, you will get Iberish positivity because it is usually EBV associated, whereas SNUC is not associated. This is the one I was talking that you cannot depend on cobedo necrosis. These are four different tumors in the sinonasal region which are showing cobedo necrosis. They were all, uh, you know, uh, the labels are not seen, but I know this is salivary duct carcinoma, which all usually shows comedo necrosis. This is our SNUC showing comedo, sebaceous carcinoma, which can also be seen in sinonasal tract. And this is basal oil squamous carcinoma showing comedo necrosis. That can also be seen in high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So, really, you cannot depend on uh, this. Now we go to the next case. He was 35 male, younger male with history of tobacco chewing. He also presented with rapidly growing mass destroying the wall of ethmoid sinus with extension to ICF, a common finding. Diagnosis on biopsy was poorly differentiated carcinoma, query squamous, query SNC. See, depending upon person's experience, you know, differential diagnosis keeps on changing. Many people will put squamous cell non keratinizing as the first, but you must know that in sinonasal tract, Poorly differentiated non keratinizing squamous carcinoma is not so common, unlike oral cavity or down below. So, you have to keep these undifferentiated tumors also in mind while uh, diagnosing this. So, look at this tumor. It is different from the first two cases. Here, you have getting nest and trabeculae, and they have a peculiar arrangement around the, around the vessel. So, you see a lot of perivascular roses. There is a vessel running through. These are not. Uh, these are not actually homerite rosettes. This is a big perivascular rosette. The nuclei appear oval or little spindly, and they are hyperchromatic, but you cannot see chromatin clumping here. There are hardly nucleoli, whereas some of them are showing. But overall, the picture is monomorphic, unlike the SNUC, which was showing pleomorphic nuclei. And you see a lot of apoptosis over here. Necrosis was not seen. and nucleoli were not so prominent. Again, same thing, EMA, CK. So this shows epithelial markers and it also shows neuroendocrine markers, okay? Because synapto is always kept as a primary panel. Once synapto comes positive, we always go to chromogranin as a secondary panel. So how do you diagnose poorly differentiated uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma? Because sinonasal tract hardly ever shows the differentiated or neuroendocrine tumors that you see in GI tract. So beware before you call carcinoid, excuse me, why it is jumping? So neuroendocrine carcinoma cannot be really diagnosed on morphology. 
based on that typical neuroendocrine pro nuclei with triple chromatin or perivascular roses. No, these are just soft clues to lead you to the proper immuno because they will lack neuropil as is the diagnostic features in olfactory neuroblastoma. So these are all non-specific features. So what you need for diagnosis? Minimum two neuroendocrine markers positivity. And that at times can be focal because it is poorly differentiated but it should not be very scanty and very weak. It has to be good positivity in, uh, you know, uh, good extent of the tumor. Then only one can call, call it as a neuroendocrine carcinoma. You can use synapto, chromo, CD56, and even CD57. But these days we do not depend on uh, NAC. Now, SNEC has a worse prognosis than olfactory neuroblastoma, and SNEC usually are advanced state and systemic therapy is needed. So even on the biopsy, you must segregate SNEC from olfactory neuroblastoma, which uh, where you know may be of help because olfactory neuroblastoma will show you nice synaptophysine positivity and S100 and also calritinin positivity, whereas sustenticular cells can be uh, S100 positivity. But as you go to the higher grade, the sustenticular cells will be reduced in number. So pathological subcategorization of all these neuroectodermal tumors is imperative for management as well as for prognosis. Now here you will get a lot of tables with, because of the time restraints, I'm not really going through. I have already described you the important features on morphology, uh, including one more feature, vascular, many articles will mention that SNUC, this is the first group, will show you vascular permeation. And that's why necrosis and apoptosis is very common. Whereas uh, this one is the nasopharyngeal carcinoma, undifferentiated carcinoma, will not show vascular permeation and rarely show necrosis. EBV important, I'd already mentioned. One more point worth mentioning is sometimes in a neuroendocrine carcinoma, you get glandular metaplasia or it better said glandular differentiation, which is known at other sites also. And here also immunohistochemistry is very helpful to distinguish the two because these glandular markers will be positive in here, whereas neuroendocrine markers will be positive in the neuroendocrine part. So what are the other neuroendocrine tumors of the sinonasal tract? These are the two important ones, SNEC and olfactory neuroblastoma, but you can also get paraganglioma and very rarely PNET, which are in fact non-epithelial tumors. So these are CK EMA negative. Whereas SNEC and SNTCS, which shows abortive neural uh, differentiation, is an epithelial tumor and therefore likely to show CK EMA positivity. I have included alveolar abdomyosarcoma, which really doesn't belong to NET, but by immunohistochemistry, sometimes it can show focal CK and synaptophysin positivity. So it is possible to get misdiagnosed as neuroendocrine tumors, and you have to be particularly particular about it. We go to the next case, which was again 35-year-old female who presented with nasal obstruction and epiphora since three months with occasional nasal pain. On examination, there was bulky mass measuring five by four in nasal cavity, basically, and swelling on the left side of hose. Now, CT scan showed heterogeneously enhancing mass six by five centimeter, left nasal cavity causing local bony and soft tissue erosion and destruction of the maxillary sinus. I'm sorry, the tumor is over here. This is the tumor involving maxillary sinus and it is also extending upwards and downwards. It doesn't remain localized. Now look at these microphotographs. Another round cell tumor, but again it is seen in the nest. Is it basaloid cells? Will you call it basal oil cells? Not particularly, but they are round cell with scanty cytoplasm, nest of loosely cohesive cell, irregular outline. Palisading is seen very focally, as you can see here. On higher magnification, there is very rare palisading, but the cells are loosely cohesive, very monotonous. Unlike basal oil schemas carcinoma, which shows pleomorphism, which shows a lot of mitotic and apoptotic activity, here that activity is not seen. So again, we are at a loss whether it is epithelial tumor or whether it is round cell tumor. There is a lot of stroma around, which is fibrovascular, but you do not see any neuropil here. You do not see any rosette. So nest of the tumor, this one I, am, I have uh, clicked to show you the 
no, palisading. So what is your differential diagnosis? You have to keep a broad differential diagnosis. You are like poorly differentiated carcinoma, which should always be there, malignant lung cell tumor, and any other differentiated tumor. We have so many at this site. So what is, again, the uh, considering the size and morphology, olfactory neuroblastoma, high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma, basal oil squamous carcinoma, nut midline, ARMS, and lymphoma little on the lower side. So you have to keep a broad differential diagnosis and again add, go on uh, giving immunohistochemistry panels. So this is CK. Next is synaptophysine. And can you make out this? This is a nuclear marker, P40. You can either use P40 or P63. And this is, I have included a decimal. I must say in sinonasal tract, whenever there is a round cell tumor, you must include testing. Whether it shows rhabdomyoblastic differentiation, whether it shows alveolar pattern or not, whether, you know, spindle cells, myxoistroma, it is better to include desmin. So since our di differential was olfactory, high-grade, basaloid, and alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. Now we were confused that synapto and P40 both came nice positivity. CK positivity was okay, but what about these two? So what do we do with that? How do we construct the second panel? Now this is what, this case is rather difficult, but I have selected only to show you how to construct the panels. Now, I couldn't explain there why uh, synaptophysin and P40 both are positive. So, okay, we gave second panel, nut antigen, EMA to know whether it is epithelial tumor, one synapto is positive, chromogranin, and also have a second look at the morphology to rule out basal oil. There was no squamous differentiation whatsoever. Uh, then nut antigen was negative. Um, chromogranin was negative. So we could rule out all these things, okay? ARMS was ruled out because testmin was negative. And this is one more marker we did. Can you make out, can any bright student make out what is this marker? Membrane positivity in a round cell tumor. I said lymphoma is little lower down. So this is surely not a CD marker. So this was MIC2, okay? So we had MIC2 positivity. Uh, CK positivity, P40, and synaptophysin. Again, a very odd combination, but we have to go ahead. Now, mid to positivity uh, is not at all specific, but still, it is very helpful in coming on the track. It gives you nice clues. And what are the possibilities? PNET, synovial sarcoma, and alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. Again, because ARMS not only can show you synaptophysin and CK, but sometimes can also show you mid to. Okay, but here we have ruled out as ARMS because desmin is negative. That is the role of desmin, including in the first panel in any round cell tumor. So what are the tertiary panel? Oh, I wanted to hide that. We did a specific markers. Now MIC2 is a sensitive marker. We never thought of synovial sarcoma. If we really wanted to prove synovial, we could have done TLE1, but we thought PNET is the better, uh, better one. And therefore, we use two specific markers here, FLY1, NKX2.2. Both are nuclear markers and both were positive. So what is it? It is adamantinomatous variant of Ewing's family tumor. That's why besides MIC2 and NKX2.2, it also, and synaptophysin, which are shown by the usual PNET, this one also showed P40. And CK, which usually you do not see in PNET. So this variant is known to occur in sinonasal tract in head and neck, which is first described by Justice Bishop. Since my goal here is to tell you how to, uh, you know, crack the cases, I'm not dealing with the main lesion or I'm not describing the main tumor. So here, what, what was confusing is variety of markers were positive. It is an epithelial tumor because CKEMA is positive. It is a basal cell origin, basal type, because in our case, P40 was positive, and that's why we thought of basal oil squamous carcinoma. But uh, squamous differentiation was not seen and pleomorphism wasn't there. We thought of neuroendocrine because synaptophysin was positive, but other markers came out negative. And because we did CD99 later, we got a clue and then we gave a specific markers which came positive and which clinched the diagnosis. So even though you may not know this entity because it is recently described entity, but if you go systematically, you know, you can 
crack the case. Recently diagnosed occurs in third decade with slight female pre predominance. It is a round cell tumor in loosely cohesive nest is the common pattern, but you can so see diffuse pattern, somewhere trabeculation also. So patterns are again not at all important. Unique immunoprofile showing epithelial, neuroendocrine, basal cell, and U Ewing's family tumor markers. Now you must get these specific markers, otherwise better to do molecular study to prove this case because of this variety of markers positivity. It mimics many other common tumors, as you have seen, is an early diagnosis is important because the treatment is based on what you give for PNET, and treatment will be different from uh, carcinomas. So now this table again discusses the differential diagnosis between the small ground cell tumor. Some of them will be carcinoma, like basaloid and nut midline, and some are non-epithelial tumors. And again, I'm not going to go into details, variety of markers, systematic application will help you to come to the final diagnosis. Little bit about MIC2 positivity. See, variety of tumors can show MIC2 positivity as it is a sensitive marker. So you go to the specific markers like FLY1, NKX2.2. T lymphoblastic lymphoma, you must remember because here, ACA can be negative, MIC2 can be positive, so don't jump to the conclusion of PNET. You do TDT, you do other markers, T cell markers to diagnose T lymphoblastic lymphoma. This usually has to be distinguished when the bone involvement is seen because this can be the differential diagnosis in young patient. Alveolar abdomyosarcoma, you have to do desmin and then myogenin, which is more specific. Small cell synovial, you cannot use BCL2, MIC2, and calponin. You have to do TLE1. And of course, if required molecular study, you also get mesenchymal chondrosarcoma in the synonasal region, which can be MIC2 positivity, ascended positivity. But you have to do, sorry, it is SOX9 to prove it that it is mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. As for SNTCS, it is the deep cuts and look for the more elements which will be diagnostic rather than doing the different immunostochemistry. So all these can show MIG2 positivity. There are many more, but these tumors will occur in synonasal tract. So take home message here is undifferentiated round cell tumors in head and neck, especially synonasal, has a long list of differential. MIG2, though non-specific, it's a very useful marker and sensitive marker. Otherwise, this diagnosis, this PNET diagnosis would have been completely missed if we had not used MIC2. Awareness of all these newer entities is very important as uh, some of these are really an aggressive tumor and they have a definitive treatment. Therefore, systematic approach is necessary. Now, in sinonasal tract, you get a variety of round cell tumors. These are the usual. Those are Classically labeled as round cell tumors like embryonal alveolar abdomyo, olfactory neuroblasto, hematolymphoid, which also include extramyeloid tumors. Plasma cytoma is known to occur in nasal and nasopharyngeal. Pinate, as I've shown you, extraskeletal mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, and DSRCT and progonoma are rare tumors. But this is what you must know that some of the other tumors also can appear around cell, like polydifferentiated synovial, small cell melanoma. How many of you have seen small cell non melanotic melanoma mimicking a round cell tumor in synonasal tract? For that matter, spindle cell melanotic melanoma mimicking soft tissue sarcoma. Also, the primitive neuroectodermal component in sinonasal teratocarcinosarcoma will resemble SNEC or even olfactory neuroblastoma because it can show the olfactory rosettes also. Nut midline carcinoma, SNUC, SNEC, we already talked about. And the numerous basaloid tumors also are included in round cell when they have a diffuse pattern rather than well-defined nest. So coming to the round cell tumors now, we have done with the epithelial tumors. The most differentiated round cell tumor is olfactory neuroblastoma because it shows neuropil, it shows different rosettes, and next to it is the rhabdomyosarcoma because it shows rhabdomyoplast. So if nests are seen, think about olfactory neuroblastoma first in the sinonasal tract, nest of round cell tumor, first thing first is with olfactory neuroblastoma. So look for neuropil and homerite rosettes higher grade will, will not show you these roses and can show necrosis. There it comes in the group of undifferentiated or poorly differentiated tumor. In contrast, if you see spindle cells or oval cells with myxoistroma, wreath-like giant cells or pomade cells, alveolar pattern or sometimes even solid pattern, 
think about rhabdomyosarcoma and start looking for rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. Look for, always look for squamous differentiation, but beware that squamous differentiation doesn't mean squamous carcinoma in sinonasal tract because even nut midline carcinoma can show you squamous differentiation. But if no differentiation is seen, squamous, glandular, roses, and all, think about lymphoma, chloroma, PNET, and even melanoma, which is amelanotic. So this is how you can go in the sinonasal tract. Ancillary techniques are almost mandatory for poorly differentiated, all poorly differentiated and undifferentiated tumors. And these are the usual, as I told you, for the poorly differentiated carcinoma type, for poorly differentiated brown cell tumor, the immunohistochemistry primary panel, which you will use is Synapto, S100, Desmin, LCA, and UMA very important. And then depending upon the positivity, you go to the next or the secondary panel. Electron microscopy was done before for neuronal differentiation and rhabdomyoblast in round cell tumors. But these days we rely more on immunohistochemistry and of course molecular tests for the final confirmation. So this is this one tells you about what should be the immuno primary panel. I already mentioned MIG2, you can decide whether to use or not because peanuts are not very common in sinonasal tract. So depending upon the morphology, but you would use either CK, EMA, Desmin, Synapto, LCA, and S100 as a primary panel. If you get this positivity, you think about um, WT1, INI1, and neuroendocrine markers. Desmin for uh, if Desmin positive, of course, myogen in myod one, MIG2 positivity. I showed you fly one in case 2.2, LCA, SOX9, synaptophysin. You have to add other uh, neuroendocrine markers and also MIG2, LCA, of course, other uh, lymphoid markers. Don't forget to use CKIT, CD34 for EMMT, extramedullary myelot, and TDT for lymphoblastic and S100, particularly for melanoma. SOX10 is also is one of the markers. So these are not so specific, but sensitive. And then you go to specific markers. So another case of 35-year-old male who presented with interesting thing, nasal mass and a parotid nodule. So the nasal mass was biopsied outside, which was called query MRCT, query poorly differentiated carcinoma. Nothing unusual. And uh, SNEC was also considered and referred for immunohistochemistry chemistry to higher center. Somewhere FNEC of parotid nodule was done and it was just said metastasis, query uh, poorly differentiated carcinoma. So this is how it looked. Here also you have little bit of nesting pattern and a diffuse, but note they are not cohesive cells. They don't look epithelial, unlike our previous cases where distinct epithelial look was there. So, but still, primary panel included CK, EMA, Synapto, S100, and Desmin. And what do you expect to come positive? CK, EMA, S100 was negative, saying that it is not an epithelial tumor, as we guessed on morphology. But both the Desmin and Synaptophysin came positivity. Again, I'm reiterating, I have selected such cases where the immunohistochemistry panel will lead to confusion, but you have to come out of it by ordering right panel. So now you have to little bit think, how will you construct a secondary immunopanel, which was tough. Because Desmin and Synaptophagin were both positive, we had to think about SNTCS, Synonasal Teratocarcinosarcoma, which can show both positivity. Olfactory neuroblastoma can rarely show rhabdomyoblastic differentiation and DSRCT, that is desmoplastic small round cell tumor. This is more of theoretical than the practical inclusion in the group, which can show desmin and synapto positivity. Only synaptophysin, then you always have to ask for chromogranin for olfactory neuroblastoma and also neuroendocrine carcinoma. Only desmin positivity should be followed by myogenin and myod one This you have to do. And therefore, our secondary panel included chromogranin, myogenin, and myod one And let's see what came positive. Myogenin and myod one both nuclear markers. And why? Because this is a solid variant of alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, which can show synaptophysin, which can show focal CK positivity, and rarely MIG2. So these are some of the vagaries or uh, you know, differentiation in uh, vagaries of immunohistochemistry. So while applying immunohistochemistry, you should be aware of these also, which are the uh, specific markers, as I mentioned, and which is the aberrant expression. 
So here is the role of a molecular test. And these days, more and more molecular tests have been used, you know, being more and more specific about the diagnosis. So this one gives you in ARMS, as you know, PAX3 or PAX7 with FK HR fusion transcript is seen and it diagnoses the ARMS. Any doubt, you must do this particular test. ESP and NT, of course, 1122 translocation, EWS R1 fly1, and EWS ERG fusion transcript can be seen. DSRCT also EWS WT1 fusion transcript. So also synovial sarcoma. So these things are become necessity for diagnosis. Okay, because again management depends on that. So now these are four different tumors and our these things are, can you make out which one is carcinoma, which one is round cell tumor, which one is what? I can only make out this because I have just shown you this and this is I call solid variant of alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. Some pink cells are seen though, which uh, we did not see earlier. So this is the previous case. But can you make out what is this? It shows little bit of plasma cytic appearance and dark nuclei. This is small cell melanoma. This one is neuroendocrine carcinoma. Note that perivascular rosettes are seen here and it looks more epithelial. And this one, I really don't remember what it is. Let's see. So melanoma, sinonasal uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma, ARMS, and this is olfactory neuroblastoma. See, the rosettes are not seen, though I say it is the most differentiated tumor, depends. But look, the monotonous cells, you know, all cells look alike. The, this was calretinine positive in the cells and uh, S and red was positive in sustenticular cells. Okay, So this is how really you cannot make out only on morphology, but always immunohistochemistry markers and uh, molecular tests come to your rescue wherever and you should use them. Remember for mesenchymal conro, it is SOX9 and desmoplastic small round cell tumor, it is WT1. Ewing sarcoma, I just showed you. So what are the newer? Quickly, I will go to, I have finished the two large groups of uh, carcinomas and uh, round cell tumors. I already mentioned, I'm not covering spindle cell tumors. So these are the newer entities in the sinonasal carcinoma. Nut midline, HPV associated multiphenotypic, which doesn't come in the group of undifferentiated, besides uh, Anchal has elaborated on it. Smart V1 deficient sinonasal, I showed you, which was basal -like type. Oh, I, okay, I, then IDH deficient. Some of the SNUC shows uh, IDH uh, mutations. The renal cell like adenocarcinoma, which is again not a undifferentiated and biphenotypic sinonasal carcinoma. So let's see another undifferentiated tumor in a younger patient who also presented with nasal blockade since three months, bleeding from nostrils, soft tissue mass, occupying nasal cavities, bilateral, invading ethmoid, sphenoid, and maxillary sinus. So you see this all high-grade tumors will show KI67 uh, uh, index very high. It will be definitely more than 30%, but even more than 50%. And they always show more than one sinus involvement. So it will be nasal for ethmoid, nasal plus maxillary, so on and so forth with bony wall destruction. So that is how you come to know before a biopsy lands up on your table. Now see, unlike the previous tumor, see here how it is showing a little bit of pleomorphism and it is showing polymorphs. And here some differentiation is seen, which looks like a famous differentiation. So have you guessed? Uh, High-grade morphology, sinonasal tumor in a young patient showing squamous differentiation, but the tumor doesn't appear to be squamous carcinoma. So this is the frank squamous differentiation, as you can see here, highlighted. So this is important diagnostic clue. And this is the immunohistochemistry, CK positivity, P63 positivity. Is it squamous carcinoma? No. So that's why P63 comes positive in many of the sinonasal tumors, okay? Round cells also, for that matter, even in lymphoma, P63 comes positive. Okay, so you cannot use it to distinguish nasopharyngeal undifferentiated carcinoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. LCA was negative, MIG2 was negative. So this was our primary panel. We also used Desmin, Synapto, Chromo, and S100. Okay, all came negative. So neuroendocrine carcinoma was ruled out. And you must have identified with this particular, you know, this is the specific marker. Look at the speckle nuclear positivity, jumping 
I think it also wants to go fast. So see this characteristic speckled nuclear positivity with nut antigen. So it is specific tumor that is nut midline carcinoma. With this kind of a positivity and with this kind of a squamous differentiation, the molecular test is not really necessary, but quite often you have to do because the immuno doesn't come properly. And then you can show that nut gene and BRD4 gene are fused with extra yellow, or they are also showing you uh, break apart uh, appearance of separation of red and green signal. So here about nut midline carcinoma, what is diagnostic clues? Abrupt squamous differentiation and cytoplasmic clearing. Sometimes there are two areas, lack of pleomorphism also, and pleomorphism can also be seen. In undifferentiated tumors, these are the clues to diagnosis. So you cannot use pleomorphism as a diagnostic clue, but certainly abrupt squamous differentiation and cytoplasmic clearing. Sometimes you can see spindle cell morphology, extensive neutrophilic infiltration, as I've showed in my case, and rosetting also. Now, rosetting again will be confusing with other tumors, which also show rosetting, but this kind of a squamous differentiation differentiation is important, usually in younger patients. Little bit about abrupt squamous differentiation, which can be seen in the sinonasal tumors, nut midline is the most important, but you also see abrupt keratinization in basal or squamous cell carcinoma, where the cells look basaloid and dark blue, and they are definitely pleomorphic and high grade. Whereas SNTCS is known to show fetal type of squamous differentiation, not really abrupt keratinization, not really a regular squamous differentiation, but fetal type of squamous differentiation. So this is the last tumor, a pink tumor, uh, which was also a little undifferentiated. Again, now this one was elderly male, known hypertension and no significant past history. Here you can see the imaging, it is involving the maxillary sinus with extension to nasal cavity also, orbital floor was invaded. And the radiological diagnosis was malignant tumor query type, histopathologic correlation required. So debulking was done. Low power shows the you know, normal epithelium and tumor like this. No inside to carcinoma was seen. Now, unlike the previous tumor, it is a truly epithelial tumor, or you can say sarcoma with epithelioid features with big, big tumor cells, round nuclei, prominent nucleol, and abundant pink cytoplasm. Is it getting to, you know, is it offering any diagnostic clue? So what are the other tumors which can show similar morphology? Amelanotic melanoma, which can be either small cell or large cell, which can show prominent nucleoli, no pigment. You can also have a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. I have seen involving sinonasal tract, which really mimics melanoma, no pigment. Again, round nuclei, abundant pink cytoplasm. This also shows comedotype of necrosis. And you can see myoepithelial carcinoma, which doesn't show prominent nucleoli, but it can show abundant pink cytoplasm, and which can also show plasmacytic appearance. So all these are loosely cohesive cells, diffuse pattern, and dense pink cytoplasm. So the area of large cell malignant tumor with round nuclei is different from the small round cell tumor. So large cell neuroendocrine, proximal variant of epithelial sarcoma, amelanotic melanoma, and myotypical carcinoma. Here I wanted to tell you that when any tumor cell shows abundant pink cytoplasm, it is due to either specific organelles like neurosecretory granules, pre-melanosomes in melanoma, or due to filaments like what happens in myoepithelial carcinoma or sometimes in rhabdomyosarcoma. But this particular tumor was has a specific uh, diagnostic clue that they showed rhabdoid morphology, as you can see here, and perinuclear clearing, perinuclear light zone, which is better seen in this particular photograph. And that is uh, highlighted in electron microphotograph, this is one particular cell, a nucleus which is at the periphery, and perinuclear zone is showing what is known as filamentous cytoplasmic inclusion. This is because all rhabdoid cells will show you cytoplasmic filaments. So is there any marker to say this is a rhabdoid phenotype because the rhabdoid phenotype can be seen in variety of tumors and still it will not be a rhabdoid tumor. So SMART B1 or INI1 is a tumor separation gene which is located on chromosome 22Q11.2 and the inactivation of gene is implicated in pathogenesis of a diverse group of malignant neoplasm which all share rhabdoid morphology. Which are they? 
poorly differentiated carcinoma with rhabdoid phenotype, where sometimes even melanoma can show rhabdoid phenotype. But specific tumors are, of course, malignant rhabdoid tumor, ATRT, that is a brain tumor, and proximal variant of epithelioid sarcoma. And now we have one more tumor, that is, so the single marker has cracked this particular case. This is INI1 or SMARC1. And this is deficient. Usually it is retained in the tumor cells and here it is lost. So this is a smart V1 deficient cyanonasal carcinoma. Here it is showing rhabdoid type. In the beginning, I also showed you the basalite type. So depending on the morphology, your differential diagnosis will be different. And naturally, your immunopanels will be different. So Sinonasal tract tumors always offer considerable diagnostic and therapeutic challenges. So increased awareness of complexity and their diversity is necessary for whatever worth, value, clinical radiological correlation has to be done to know which sites are involved. I have not shown you the picture of site specificity. That is very useful. Certain tumors originate in nasal cavity, certain in maxillary, whereas nasoethmoid region is more common for neuroendocrine tumors. Adequate sample is prerequisite in sinonasal tumors, obviously, because of large number of poorly differentiated and undifferentiated tumors. So always avoid pinpoint diagnosis on pinhead tumor tissue. If you see pinhead tumor tissue, don't classify. Just say whether it is malignant or not, epithelial or not, if you can make out and ask for the repeat biopsy. Then only you can use the ancillary techniques, mainly immunohistochemistry. And I showed you that very rarely you will crack the difficult case with single immunopanel. You will need second, third panel, sometimes even four. And, but it is worth it because the multimodality treatment, also mutilating surgery depends on histologic type. And that's why you have to offer the diagnosis on biopsy. And that's why adequate tissue is very important. Accurate pre-therapy pre diagnosis must in today's era of evidence-based medicine and multimodality treatment. Therefore, high index of suspicion in view of rare tumors, the systematic approach and a lot of knowledge of immunohistochemistry is necessary. Not to forget more CMEs like this, which is the need of the hour because CMEs in sinonasal region are very few and far in between uh, in India. So diagnosis of immunohistochemistry test is no greater than the wisdom of the pathologist designing and interpreting it. And I thought I gave you various examples to prove this, that it is not the immunohistochemistry which helps you to crack. It is the, you know, the systematic approach to immunohistochemistry and a lot of knowledge or wisdom goes behind that. So I showed you the stepwise panel, how to apply primary with sensitive immuno, then secondary narrowing the differential diagnosis. And lastly, the tertiary panel where you use more specific markers. So remember IIC is a double-edged weapon. We have seen at the working at the tertiary institute, we have seen that people, uh, you know, making wrong diagnosis based on limited immunohistochemistry and uh, sensitive immuno and not very specific immuno. So sensitive has to be followed by the specific markers and you must interpret it properly and integrate with morphology, clinical radiological finding and adding a bit of wisdom, which is very uh, very essential, though quite difficult because we need to have experience, maturity also for applying all these things and integrating. And that is the successful formula for cracking any difficult case, any unexpected case. Uh, we have seen so many uh, you know, challenging cases that pediatric tumor cases occurring in adults and vice versa. All these can be cracked if you really have a very systematic approach. And that is what I have tried to see. But friends, do not forget, after all, it's a teamwork. And the, it is the power of teamwork which makes the impossible also possible. So thank you very much for the patient listening. And I hope I have restricted, you know, I have left some time for the questions. Thank you once again. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a very wonderful and elaborate lecture. Hmm? I've learned three basic things. One has to pay a detailed attention to the morphology. 
large or small round cells, rhabdoid, epithelioid, basiloid. Step number two, use IHC, but use it judiciously. You are an Indian. Don't do everything in the first go. Step one, step two, step three. Step number three is do not compromise in getting to your final diagnosis. Use all the modalities possible to come to the right diagnosis at the end. I think this is a, this has been one of the most wonderful talks I have ever heard. And uh, you, have, you have been very true and very, very clear with the time also. Uh, there are just two questions before we pass on to those two questions. Uh, one, one, one thing which I, I think I would, I would like to tell all the postgraduates and young pathologists around here is that if I show you a picture of a, of a country, which is full of green, which is very green and full of vegetations with good beaches, good lakes, good rivers, good mountains. Which country will you think it is? There are many. But first you will have to ask whether it's in India, whether it is in South India, whether it is Goa or Kerala. And you have to see if there is an elephant somewhere standing. See if the elephant is in a crowd. Is it in front of a temple? Is it dressed up? And then you know it is Kerala. So you may be taken up by the beauty of, of, of the slides and what you see. But finally, the final word, as Madam has said, remains improving clearly to the mm. last letter what you are exactly seeing. Uh, Madam, the first question uh, is, I think you have answered that. It's about the case of Ewing sarcoma in which you have said it is an adamantinomatous variant of Ewing sarcoma. So the question is why, why it is called as adamantinomatous variant and not simply Ewing sarcoma? Yeah, I think you have to ask the, uh, you know, Justin uh, Bishop. But anyway, whatever we know, you all will agree that it is not the usual type of PNAT, which can be easily classified as round cell tumor. Here, if you notice, they look nest, very well-defined nest, and the cells were also a little different. The usual perithelial pattern was not seen. How do we diagnose PNAT? With uh, sheets of cells, monotonous cells with perithelial pattern. You get small, small vessels within. So that uh, typical pattern was not seen and there was a palisading. So there is some amount of basaloid differentiation and you can also see squamous differentiation. I did not complicate it. I had another case with squamous differentiation within this, but still it is not basaloid squamous carcinoma. So because of this pattern, they thought first that in head and neck, it resembled adamantinoma or amyloblastoma. Epithelial look with palisading. Thank That's you. The second question is, is yes, about... I wanted to tell you that you have summed up very nicely and you have really picked up all the things in my lecture. I hope your PGs also have done that. Ah, sure, okay. sure. Madam, second question is, uh, is about new, the new Estesio neuroblastoma. This is, is cytokeratin always negative in neuroblastoma or can it be positive in a few cases? Focally, focally can be positive. That's why that group is made. No, olfactory neuroblastoma, SNEC and this. CK can be focally there. EMA usually is not there. And synaptophysine, calretinine, and always look for S and red. In olfactory neuroblastoma, we have advantage of sustenticular positivity brought out by S and red. But CK, okay. that is why we do EMA. It's like EMA is more epithelial. CK can be seen in the ONB as well as uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. Thank you so much, madam. Let me conclude by saying a big thank you to you. Uh, usually the policemen use the word crack. <laughs> but <laughs> every time you have to say, <laughs> we'll crack this case. Yeah, yeah, crack. The case is crack. Maybe <laughs> media. This year, the word is favorite with media people. Yeah. In the paper. So, not think, really policemen. <laughs> we pathologists should also think like policemen in cracking our cases, as you have said. Uh, and uh, it has been a wonderful experience. I thank, uh, for, on behalf of Kerala chapter, uh, yourself and all the people who have attended and participated. And I thank uh, Rajan sir and Annie for uh, making me the moderator and making me listen to Madam also. Thank you very much and wish you all a good Sorry, sleep. I have to speak after you, but I always say a good pathologist is a detective. 
<laughs> you have to go on like a detective person till at the end. You that is why I always use crack the case. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, madam. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Rajan sir. Over to you. Okay. Thank you, madam, for the wonderful presentation. So uh, it's very algorithmic approach, as the title says. Okay, I think. Uh, so almost everybody is holds up to the seat till now because there is not much drop out till now. But no. okay, thank you. Because you, we are in Kerala. I must say, I don't know. <laughs> I give credit to Kerala PGs. <laughs> not only it's a, it's across India, no? it's across India. Because... Okay. Yeah. So okay. and uh, you can ask your PGs if they want to ask question. They can put on my email. You can uh, give them the email and. Uh, no, they can ask questions. That can be done, madam. So, any? Uh, yes, sir. So, thank you, ma'am and sir, for that wonderful session. So, we have come to the end of today's session. Um, I just like to announce there are a few changes that have uh, we have actually already spoke about. So, for tomorrow's session, please note the first session starts at six thirty p.m. by Waki, Dr. Joaquin Garcia, the talk on emerging entities in the head and neck pathology. The second talk will be by Dr. Munita Bal at 7.30. Um, she will speak on squamous cell carcinoma traps and tricks of the trade. And the last talk of this webinar will be by Dr. Paramita Roy at 8.30 p.m. tackling the stumbling block of salivary glands tumors in a resource-constrained con setting. So um, I hope all of you will join us back tomorrow at sharp 6.30 p.m. Um, with that, I think we'll conclude today's sessions. I just, I would like to thank everyone we have joined here today, uh, along with the speakers and the moderators. So, um, so. You can say good night, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you, Shankar. Thank you, Smita. Thank you, Anshan, and thank you, Kanan, madam. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, sir. Good night, everyone. Now I'll close the webinar. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Mr. Nickel. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Good night. See you tomorrow. Bye. Yes.